Okay, do it. But I think that's that's the best that we're gonna do. Okay, that's all right. Okay, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Again, we apologize for these first fifteen minutes of um, struggle. <laughs> we're we're here now. Yep. So basically, um, yeah. Welcome everybody to this whiteness seminar. We're just going to start off by introducing ourselves for everybody that doesn't know us. So I am Lisa, I'm a journalist, writer, documentary filmmaker, poet, but more importantly, uh, an unemployed graduate. And just for to make it relevant here, I'm like mixed race. My mum is black Zambian, my dad is white English. Um, I grew up in a majority white um, area in the UK. Yep, and um, I'm Isolt. I just graduated from an anthropology and international development degree. I'm currently working for a French fair trade um, NGO. And, um, and to situate myself on the racial spectrum, I'm very obviously white and I'm French and Irish. So that I'm mostly going to be talking from a French perspective, not really from an Irish one. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. So I think the thing that we wanted to start with was a quote that I um, discovered in a song that a teacher showed me, actually. So the song is from a man called Frank Wall, who's a Lakota rapper. So he's um, indigenous from the southern western United States. And it's a quote from a man called jo John Trudeau, who's a Dakota poet. And he's also a political activist and uh, a musician. And so the quote goes this way. We have never really seen the war go away. I mean, if you're dying, if you're dying from the seventh cavalry, cavalry's bullets, if you're dying from induced poverty and racism and class systems and sex systems, and you're dying from alcoholism and poverty, or someone has now come in the name of maximizing the profits, and they're getting you to work in the mines, the uranium mines, and you're dying from lung cancer, and you're dying from the cancers and the disease that come out of that, you're dying. It's the same as the bullet killing you, and I see it all as a war. Yeah, so leading off from that quote, just to start off um, the conversation, before we talk about whiteness and we delve into that, we just need to kind of lay the groundwork and talk about racism and how we all live in a racist society. And that means that because of the color of your skin, whatever skin you're born with, you're either going to be in a, in a place of advantage or you're going to be a place of disadvantage and so when we talk about racism you know often people like to connect it with like one lone incident so you know somebody may be using racist slurs on the street but here when we're talking about it like racism is an institutional thing you know it kind of bleeds through the fabric of society and so and it's also constructed by a certain group and this is something that we're going to be talking about later but we just need to drill in the fact that we are not equal in this society and certain people obviously if you have um, a darker complexion you're, you're going to be at a loss compared to somebody with a white complexion who is going to um, have a privilege in society yeah so um we kind of want to make a bit of a PSA because very obviously white people are always at the center. And so we're very much aware that this entire conversation could really be problematic and it's kind of, it could be really dangerous in the sense that putting white people in the center of a discussion on race is again, putting white people at the center. So the danger is kind of reproducing this um, white dominance and placing it in, in, again in another place. But we're consciously choosing to put the, refle the um, reflection on whiteness, because our aim is to deconstruct it to the extent that it's possible, but also to reflect on the unearned advantages and meanings that are inherently associating, associated with whiteness. So we hope that this seminar and conversations like these ones um, could be a path to normalizing the fact that owning whiteness or owning a white body or a white Lee body um, inherently induces some privilege, which always comes at the cost of other people's freedom. So the first thing I'm going to tackle is the construction of race from a, from a religious point of view. So I'm going to talk to you about um, the curse of Canaan, which is in the book of Genesis. And so basically the story goes this way. Um, 
the, whoops, sorry, one sec. So the story goes this way. One day, um, Noah decided to plant a vineyard. He harvested the grapes from his vineyard and he made wine. He got drunk and he got naked. And Noah had three sons, Ham, Japheth, and Shem. One of his sons, Ham, saw him naked in his drunkenness. So he didn't do anything about it, but he went to go tell his brothers, Japheth and Shem, uh, of no estate. And so they took, what Japheth and Shem did is they took a cloth and they walked backwards towards Noah and they covered him with the cloth. So they didn't actually see his nakedness. And when Noah woke up from his drunkenness, he cursed Canaan, who is Ham's son. But Ham was the one who, connect, who committed the sin. So the exact nature of the sin has been debated for 2,000 years, so we're not really going to go into that here. But this is what Noah said. So this is uh, Genesis 9.25, if people are interested. So it's, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. So even before slavery, this passage was used to promote and justify European interests in colonization, and notably the idea that there were three different races, that there were different races. And they argued that there were three different races, each represented by one of Noah's sons. So um, Ham, Japheth, and Shem, and it was Caucasian, Mongoloid, and Ethiopian. So these were the three races, uh, you know, in the collective imaginary, I guess. So, the, so obviously the Bible is open for interpretation. We know this, it's, um, you know, various stories have been used to defend various interests. I'm thinking notably when abolitionists and slave owners use the same verses to defend each of their points of view. And, um, but going back to the curse of Canaan, what, what some slave owners in the South USA argued was that, that that story, that passage, was proof that enslaving African, that by enslaving Africans, they were furthering the will of Noah, the great patriarch. So I think it's kind of relevant to mention that before the 16th century, slavery w wasn't a racial institution, and that in Europe, we had very, very stark um, inequality between um, classes. And Nevertheless, Wait, they, Iso, yeah, some people messaging me and saying that they can't join in on the Zoom. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I've only I've got nobody uh, asking. Oh, a few asking? people have said that they can't access the Zoom. Um, I one sec. Hmm. Who is it? Um, so I have Chelsea. Oh, really? Um. Wait, sorry about this, guys. Um, mm -mm. And I have Fanasina. Yeah, that's Gaston. I've, I've just accepted oh, him. Yeah. He should be on here. Um, yeah, Gaston is in here. I'm, hmm, I don't know what to do. Uh, um, I mean, I guess we can just continue because Chelsea is watching on this, this live anyway. Um, okay, shall I continue? Yeah. Okay, um, so where was I? Oh yeah, so um, so yeah, in Europe we had very stark inequality between classes, but nevertheless, race is seen by a lot of academics as the central invention of modernity. And so it was with the transatlantic slave trade that white supremacy was used to justify slavery, and that same white supremacy was later used used to justify the exploitation of people of color in our current economic system, which is capitalism. So um, in the United States, specifically, the implementation of something called the one drop policy, which is the idea that if you have just one drop of black blood, then you are a slave. It meant that being black and being a slave became synonyms and you were white and you were free because you were white, because being black meant being a slave. So I'd like to introduce a Malcolm X quote here, which is, racism is like a Cadillac and there's a new model every year. And I'm putting that quote here because obviously racism has really changed since this biblical conception of it. And now Lisa is going to go into the more um, pseudo-scientific aspects of um, racial construction. Yeah, so as Esau was just talking about, um, she kind of laid down um, the foundations for racism as a construct on in terms of religion so i want to talk about kind of this changing time so towards the end of the 18th century we have 
a rise of abolitionist movements. You know, there's pressure from northern states on the southern states to end slavery. There's abolitionist movements in the US, but around Europe. And so this kind of um, justification through religion, it was running dry, like the pro-slavery movement needed something to, you know, like um, up like um, their justification. So luckily for them, but obviously at the detriment, detriment to ethnic minorities, this time, um, through this time came the birth of phrenology. And so phrenology is a pseudoscience, um, which means it's just a, a baseless science but it was created by a man called Franz Joseph Gould. Um, he was a, a G German physiologist. And basically he, he theorized that the brain was kind of split up into different compartments. And each of these compartments he called organs. And each of these organs related to like a certain trait or a certain ability within that person. So he believed that by analyzing like skulls and analyzing, you know, the bumps on skulls, like that related to the shape of people's brains that you could tell a lot about you know the person's intelligence and just generally about the person's personality and so you know for all of like the pro-slavery movement this was a wet dream for them they were like screaming with excitement the fact that you know you can distinguish a person like that so this was zealously picked up by the pro-slavery movement and i want to talk about um, one specific man here called Samuel Morton. Obviously, there was a lot of kind of pseudoscientists who contributed to this whirlwind of scientific racism. However, I want to focus on this man, Samuel Morton, because he is the man who influenced a lot kind of um, the pro slavery movement, and he's also the man that had the largest skull collection of the time. But before I talk about Samuel Morton, I just want to give, lay a little bit of like foundation and talk about a man called Blumenbach. And he was a German anthropologist and he basically, again, studied um, skulls. And he bas he came like a little bit before Gaul, although he wasn't strictly phrenology. He was more, you know, the study of the brain, you know, crani craniometry. Anyway, Blumenbach split. Um, the human race into five different categories. One of these categories being Caucasian. And obviously like today we think Caucasian and we think white person, um, but literally a Caucasian is somebody from you know, the Caucasus region, which is an area kind of at the borders of Eastern Europe and Western um, Asia. However, I mean, Blumenbach, he believed that humanity came from from this region and that you know people moved out and they kind of degenerated um but yeah so that's just like laying the foundation um so basically back to samuel morton morton took um blumenbach's um categorization of the different races and he was also inspired by Gaul, and he basically came up with the idea of this racial hierarchy so using blumenbach's categories he put caucasian people at the top followed by East Asians, followed by Southeast Asians, followed by Native Americans, and followed by Black people. So again, like the pro-slavery movement was screaming, you know, it's like, yes, we have somebody who is justifying, you know, our racism. We can continue to subjugate Black people because we've got these pseudoscientists, you know, spitting this kind of random, like, baseless science. And um, another person who I, who I want to talk about here, somebody that we all know is Charles Darwin. And so I'm sure we all know kind of like the theories, oops, my hand was covering this Facebook Live. Um, I'm sure we all know um, like the theory of Charles Darwin, you know, the theory of evolution. And his theory, you know, some people took his, his theory and used it to kind of argue that um, white people are more evolved than black people. And Charles Darwin's theory is kind of, you know, at the end of, slavery however it was still used to justify this like continuous like colonialism you know after slavery ended um obviously today we know that um race as like a biological category is just it, it has no base it has no scientific hold um there's no um yeah there's no scientific uh, explanation for for race category for race um, so we know today that race is solely a construction, but obviously at the time people used it and abused this kind of pseudoscience 
to back up their um, subjugation of black people. And one thing I want to note as well is that um, the rise of slavery or the birth of slavery coincided with like the European intellectual movement, the age of reason, the age of enlightenment. And so the age of reason was, you know, they, um, it was kind of intellectuals talking about liberty, talking about the rights of man, um, you know, trying to be rational about things, trying to, to question things and come up with like a reasonable ex explanation for things. And so this coincided with the birth of slavery. However, these were two like opposing, like stark opposite um, in institutions, movements, because, you know, we're talking about, you know, liberty in regards to the European. However, we're shackling and, and abusing the black man. So how can we get away with this? We need to, you know, it's the age of reason. We need to, we need to rationally explain why we're subjugating black people and why we're letting Europeans, you know, go free, talk about freedom, talk about liberty. And so then, you know, this whole justification, as Esau said, like a justification through religion, and as I talked about a justification through science, this was all needed to, you know, back up, you know, well, to pseudo, to pseudo like rationalize um, the question. Um, so basically through all of this, we can discern that race is not an anomaly. Like we didn't one day just stumble and like, oh, oh no, like we've just fallen into racism. Like black people were just you know, worse than us. It wasn't just some random thing. It was actively like consciously constructed, constructed to give power to a certain um, type of person and to subjugate, to oppress another type of person. So when we bring that into today, we can, all, we can see this structure Obviously, if we're talking about slavery and we're talking about colonialism, we're talking about, you know, capitalist kind of institutions, you know, institutions of, of, of capitalist profit. And we're putting that, you know, arguably that was the growth of this modern globalized economy. And so when we bring that to today, we can see the world that we live in. We can see this white patriarchal capitalist power structure, you know, ableist, you know, um, discriminatory in terms of like, a whole different factors, we can see that that is the structure that we live in today. Yeah, so basically, you know, today in 2020, there is to some extent the beginning of a conversation on racism, but um, it all it, it it always fo focuses on discrimination and on oppression. And I think that is very important because it is a, obviously a central part of racism. And I'm absolutely not saying that white people are excluded from this conversation, but we see ourselves as outside of the conversation. And that is because we see ourselves as outside of race. And so non-white bodies were defined as such by white people, by white bodies, and they were defined in opposition to whiteness. So and vice versa. So, for example, I'm white because I'm not Asian. I'm white because I'm not black. So, and we see that because we often make reference to a person's race when they're not white, and we rarely do when they are. For example, we always hear African American, Native American, we never hear Caucasian American. And so, what I'm trying to say is that non whiteness has been defined by the white man's eye. And I don't think we can talk about the categories that whiteness is opposed to or has opposed itself to without talking about that very whiteness. So basically, you know, racism is like a coin. Um, there, are two, there are two sides of it. One side is discrimination and the other is privilege. And racism is a systemic structural issue. And so is privilege. Privilege is a, is a system. So I basically am gonna argue that whiteness is an invisible experience and that it's an invisible experience. Oh, wait, sorry, just somebody's trying to come in. Hello. Hello, uh, Chicho. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna argue that white, whiteness is an invisible experience because privilege is an invisible experience. And it's invisible because it is the norm. So I'm gonna give just like a handful of examples here. For example, in politics, this is not gonna be news, I think, for a lot of people, but in politics, obviously, white people rule. Financially, we clearly dominate. Um, in magazines, as a white woman, I identify with all the bodies that I see. I can very easily find stuff to do with my hair, for example. 
Um, I think I can count the number of times that I've been a minority racially speaking. And, you know, in media and in movies and things like that, we're starting to hear a conversation about, you know, people of color being underrepresented, queer people, trans people being underrepresented in media. But in fact, maybe we white people are overrepresented. And so what I'm trying to say is that while others are disadvantaged, um, we are white people are, or white passing or white lead people. We are politically, economically, culturally and socially advantaged everywhere and that is because the system is designed in our favor and this is not just on an individual level this is a collective experience in both cases you know racism is a collective experience for those who experience it and privilege is a collective experience for those who who experience it so this is what we're really trying to get at it's the structural and institutional levels of both racism and privilege and i think i'd like to just say one quick quote by robin d'angelo who's a white woman who wrote a really interesting book called white fragility and she um, I highly recommend and we'll talk about it in a bit, but um, the, the quote goes this way, it's the key to recognizing power is recognizing its normalcy. And yeah, I think that's um, very important. Yeah, and I just want to kind of talk about this whiteness and even an area of irony and how even the, like the ac academic study of whiteness is not free from this whiteness. So what I want to talk about is the fact that um, the whiteness as a concept has been spoken about, you know, academically, you know, since kind of the beginning of the 20th century. And so one guy I want to, to speak about is W.E.B. Du Bois. And he is like um, one of like the most vocal or one of the most like, I guess, renowned like anti-racist scholars of like the beginning of the 20th century. He was also the first African-American to receive a doctorate at Harvard um, yeah, so just very much in kind of the anti-racist um, academic realm. And basically, he was kind of the man who laid the groundwork for whiteness. In the early like 20th century, he wrote a, a book called Dark Water, and it basically explains like whiteness as the concept that we're talking about now. And after him, we have other kind of scholars, authors. Um, I don't know, I think... My Facebook Live has finished. Okay, my <laughs> Facebook is bugging. Do you want me to try? Yeah, actually, my Facebook actually. is like closing. I think maybe I've run out of memory space on my, I don't know, on my phone. Okay, I'm quickly gonna download, you continue. I'm quickly going to download the app and um, share it. Sorry about this, guys. Um, okay, dope. So, yes, so people like W.E.B. Du Bois, was talking, talked about whiteness at the beginning of the 20th century. We have authors um, and activists such as like James Baldwin, we have Toni Morrison, all of these people came together to talk about what whiteness is. However, it didn't actually materialize as an academic discourse until the end of the 20th century. Funnily enough, because white people started talking about it themselves. So this like deep irony just shows how deep you know whiteness is just shows how deep racism is even in a situation when we're trying to be anti-racist um and i think this this brings me to another point the fact that as i said a lot of black scholars black um activists were talking about whiteness so this kind of brings in the idea that as you know an ethnic minority as the other because you're you're on the periphery and like white people are at the center you have a much better view of you know whiteness you can see much more clearly um like the privileges that white people have compared to a white person themselves and so and also um as well as seeing whiteness so much more clearly you can even you can even see like you know the world through the white gaze as well because you know being the other of course you you can you're the other so you're the oppressed you can see like the center more easily but you're still in a society where you know, we live in a white gaze, so you can see that perspective as well. It's kind of like how as a woman, as a woman, you know, you can see the perspective, you can see the world through the male gaze, but you also have like, you know, from the female perspective, um, from like the oppressed perspective. And so I just want to give you a quote by an African-American writer called James Weldon Johnson. And he wrote in one of his books, I believe it to be a fact 
that the colored people of this country know and understand the white people better than the white people know and understand them. And so basically that just kind of, um, kind of says that as like the white community, as a white person, you need to kind of get outside of this almost like programmed perception of whiteness. You need to kind of step out of that and see like the other perspective. Yeah. Just sorry, going back to the Facebook thing, I'm trying to download it, but my internet is being really slow. I mean, to be fair, there was like five people watching, so I think we can just post this. I mean, I'm record recording it, you, you're record it, recording it, I can't speak. Um, yeah. So you can just post it on the page after, if you can't. Um, maybe I'll just write a little something. Okay. I mean, I'm trying to, to download it, and when it does, I'll start filming again. But... Okay. um. Okay, so I think this conversation is um, really, one, really interesting and two, really important because we need to talk about whiteness in order to deconstruct it from within. And I think us white people collectively need to talk about it. Um, I don't think, I don't believe that people of color should be alone in this fight. Um, and really what I'm, we need to talk about the whiteness in white people. It's not really about, um, you know, it's not literally about the color of your skin. It's much more complex than that, but it's an inheritance that we carry in, in our white bodies. And so just basically to define it, um, whiteness is just basically not going through the discrimination that black indigenous and people of color or just non-white people go through. So we live in a system that is rooted in white supremacy as we've tried to explain. And so we have inherited that. And so we have to be a part of this conversation, not only because we invented it, but because we're very actively invested in it, even if unwillingly so. So, you know, I think if, it, if discrimination exists, if racism exists, that means that someone is losing, but it also means that someone is winning. And this conversation is not really had enough. And we need to talk about who is winning, how, why, how do we see it? How is it um, manifested in this in in our life, in our experience, and how do we profit from this racist inequality, even if we really don't want to? So, um, you know, I think we as white individuals, like me as a white individual, I don't believe that I invented racism. However, because at some point back in the fifteenth century, so, you know, groups of white cis, um, like rich white cis straight men who owned property created the system and they created it in their favor. They rigged it again against other people so that only they could win. You know, we have inherited that. We're, I'm, I'm, I, for example, I'm a stakeholder in that system because it was rigged in my favor, no, even if it's not my fault but it is my responsibility to kind of try to change that. So again, I'm going to say the quote by Malcolm X, which is racism is like a Cadillac. There's a new model every year. So I'm to, in order to kind of ask this question, so how in 2020 is racism still real? Because it's obviously not biblical. It's not pseudoscientific, you know, in the most parts. Um, so what I want to kind of, so from 1619 all the way to the 1960s in the United States, um, from 1619, I'm saying that because it's the date of the first, from when the first boat of slaves arrived in the United States. Um, you know, for 400 years, there was a very clearly unapologetic and clearly defined racist system. And I think it's, you know, pretty much, um, uh, you know, it's very clear that it was a system it, and it was a system that was based on that. And um, in the 1960s, with the emergence of the civil rights movement, there was really a shift in that conception of racism because once the civil rights bill was signed, there was no longer school for black students and school for white students. There was no longer toilets for black people and toilets for white people. There was, um, so the system was no longer so outrageously clear, you know? Um, and so what happened then is that the definition of a racist was re reduced to three things. One, an individual, two, who consciously dislikes non-white people, and three, who intends to harm them. And so I think this is really important. It's one, an individual, two, consciousness, and three, intent. And um, this is also D'Angelo, by the way, I'm not coming up with this myself. But um, 
this is really important, this shift, because it really obscures the reality of racism. There was never any implementation of change. There was, you know, the Civil Rights Bill was signed, the abolition of slavery was signed, um, treaties with indigenous people were signed, but there was no reparations, there, were, there was no active change, you know? So what I'm trying to say is that racism is much more than just individual prejudice because it's, it's a structural issue. You know, we keep repeating this over and over, but we're really trying to drill it in. Um, so I think a Trump voter, for example, may be a racist. And while that is unexcusable and appalling, I think it's really only the tip of the iceberg. And what's really important is the harm that the structural and institutional harm that racism induces here we're talking about chronic lack of economic opportunity, chronic um, ghettoization, chronic environmental racism. And what I'm trying to say is that there is no Mexican Trump. However, there is a white American Trump or American Trump. And um, if a Trump voter can say and can act the way that he does, it's because he has Trump and he has an entire system behind him that, in, that supports him and that enables him to say certain things and to act in certain ways. And so I think it's really, really important to put a very strong emphasis on the fact that this is not um, individual, this is, really, this is a structure, this is a system that we live in. And this leads us nicely to the topic of reverse racism. And I'm sure we all know people that have claimed to have experienced racism, you know, somebody um, who has a white comple complexion and they believe that they have experienced racism. However, let me just first take the phrase reverse racism. So even the need to put reverse at the beginning, we're distinguishing it from actual racism. It's not racism, it's something else. We need to like differentiate it it from from what we know as racism and as Esau has just said like racism is so much more than a lone incident and whilst you know for example um if a white person is um is attacked like let's take this, the case of South Africa you know sometimes there is, it has been noted that white people have been attacked or maybe they are experiencing some um sorry I've got a message anyway say um, and potentially they have experienced like and um, being subjected to like a racial slur however whilst we need to condemn this because this is an act of discrimination they do not have the entirety like the weight and the burden of all of these oppressive um factors um societal factors on them so whilst you know we're not here like saying that we should be um discriminatory against white people and we shouldn't you know obviously we need to always condemn like discrimination but it just does not like hold the same weight and so i want to kind of talk about like the symbolic versus material you know reverse racism only looks at kind of like the symbolic like the symbolic like ideological impact of prejudice whilst ignoring the ma material structural reality of racism yeah definitely i think um Racism against white people doesn't exist. But um, what I kind of want to throw in now is um, just a bit of a reflection on the conception of white, like the actual concept itself of white privilege. Um, so an African-American author or philosopher called Lewis Gordon, I think he's a sociologist, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, I haven't read his work, but his name is Lewis Gordon. And he argues that actually talking about white privilege is limiting because there's a confusion between right and privilege. And so he says, you know, housing is not a privilege, it's a right. Clean water in Flint, it's not a privilege, it's a right. And so actually by talking about white privilege for these things, we may actually be lowering the standard for what's acceptable for people of color to go through. So I think that's just really interesting. And um, going back to what you were saying about um, reverse racism, I'd like to introduce the concept of white fragility that I mentioned earlier. Um, so basically, white fragility, oh, my, my mom wants to join. Oh. Um, so, <laughs> so um, hi, Karina. So basically, white fragility is just the idea of being uncomfortable with um, either being called white or just disliking being called white or disliking once when one's privilege is pointed out to them. And so often the symptoms that, that emerge are getting defensive, getting angry, getting emotional, crying, um, being basically being called white and hearing it as an insult. So 
this is really in, related to whiteness being the norm and never being mentioned. And it's related to us seeing ourselves as outside of race. So we kind of tend to think of it as intolerable when, when our individuality is taken away and when we're linked to our racial group as a whole. But actually individuality is only a privilege that is afforded to whites. So, and I think really at the end of the day, maybe this is just people realizing that it's not fun to only be referred to as a white person because we're more than that. And, uh, but the thing is that applies for everyone. So, you know, there's a bit of a double standard when it comes to white people's reaction to being called white or being when our privilege is pointed out to us. Um, and so, you know, I know that it's not fun to think of yourself as an oppressor, especially if you feel that you've been oppressed in other ways, um, because people are multifaceted. You are more than just your race. Again, this applies to everyone. Um, but we have to come to terms with the whiteness of violence and the violence of whiteness. This is a quote from a man who has worked on um, whiteness and education. His name is Leonardo Zeus. If you guys are interested, I'll write it in the comments in a bit. So I just like to go back to the idea of being privileged but not feeling privileged. And so I think a good example is, for example, um, homosexual white guys um, might, you know, they're definitely bullied, assaulted, discriminated against on an individual level and also on a structural level. You know, we're not going to start saying that the patriarchy isn't homophobic. It is. But um, they still have that tiny little more privilege that Asian, Asian gay men won't have, for example. Just, just an example. But I'd also like to mention white working class. When we're talking about um, white privilege, we are not in any way undermining the fact that, you know, life is hard and, um, you know, we, there are very, there's very much a reality that a lot of white people are poor, but they still have that little bit more that people of color don't have. And it's been proven, it's been documented that people of color have to work twice as hard as, you know, if you put a very, I don't know, inner city, poor working class white woman next to a, exactly the same situation, but a black woman, she's going to have, the black woman is going to have to work much, much harder. Um, and so again, of course, people are complex. You are more than just your race. And so we have to talk about other issues too, class, gender, sexuality, etc. But we also really want to put an emphasis on the fact that race really strongly defines our experience, not only as individuals, but also as a collective. So, yeah. Yeah, so Esau has just kind of spoken about intersectionality, you know, the fact that we need to focus on all of these oppressing factors within this society that we live. Obviously, in this space or in this discussion, we're main, mainly focusing on race, but we need to all, you know, you know, be conscious of these other factors. And we're not saying that, you know, as Esau said, like, we're not saying all white people are living in mansions and they have like five Mercedes in their garage and they're being like, I don't know, fed grapes by their servants. No, that's not what we're saying. Like, there's other distinctions there at play. So we need to acknowledge that. But now I'm going to move on to colour blindness. And again, I'm sure we all know somebody who sanctimoniously says, you know, I don't see race, like, and they think this is helpful kind of to the cause. But this is actually very detrimental because somebody that does not see race is basically somebody that is ignoring racism. I think it goes back to the point that racism today, like a racist today, we have kind of like this view of a racist being like somebody going around like burning crosses, you know, lynching black people, you know, wearing white hoods. However, as we have said like time and time again throughout this seminar, racism is an institution. And even if you're, you know, your, your eyes are shut or your back is turned or you're closing your ears, racism still exists. It just means that you have the privilege of saying, oh, okay, I don't want to see it. I don't want to talk about it. Whereas, you know, ethnic minorities have to face this. They are forced to face this every day. And, um, you know, so we've talked about racism a lot. And I just want to give like a few different statistics just to drill in the fact that we, we do not live in a, like, in a society that has rid been ridden of racism. We still face these inequalities. So I want to give you three statistics. They're all from like a UK perspective, um, but I'm sure they're, they're applicable and they're similar to, to statistics around kind of different European countries um, like and the US. Um, so the first statistic is 
black women are five times more likely to die from complications in pregnancy than white women. Number two, if you are black and you have a degree, you'll earn 25% less than your white counterpart, counterpart, than your white person with a degree as well. Number three, black people are almost 10 times more likely to get stopped and searched by police, even though they are less likely to be caught with drugs. So these just basically just trying to hammer in the fact that we do in fact live in a racist society. We cannot be colorblind to it. And lastly, I kind of want to talk about meritocracy. Obviously, living in, in this capitalist structure, we hear, you know, the discourse a lot, you know, work hard and you'll get, you know, you'll reap the, the benefits. What you put in, you'll get out. And this just, just does not fly within this racist st structure that we live. Because, you know, if I work hard, say like me and Esau, I don't know, we go to the same primary school, we go to the same secondary school, we go to the same university, you know, everything we do is the same and we work to like the same degree of hard. ESO is automatically gonna um, reap more benefits than I am just because of the color of my skin. So when we say, you know, work hard and, and you'll get like, you know, all the benefits of this capitalist world, you know, it doesn't really fly. And so that brings me to like a nice quote by um, former American president, Lyndon B. Johnson. And, you know, we're not here to, you know, sing Lyndon B. Johnson's like, you know, graces and all of that. But he did say a nice quote. So we will say it. So basically he said, imagine a hundred yard dash in which one of the two runners has his legs shackled together. He has progressed. 10 yards while the unshackled runner has gone 50 yards and so basically you know how can we expect these people to finish the race at the same time one is shackled one is free but, you know meritocracy just says you know all, both of these people we expect them to both you know fly high within this structure but obviously that is not the case so bringing it back to like this to being colorblind you're basically just ignoring all of this. You're, you're sitting in a privileged position and, and saying, no, I don't want to hear about it, even though it is there. Yeah, and I think, again, another quote by Robin D'Angelo, which is relevant here, is acknowledging my privilege is abolishing the myth of meritocracy. And I think that's really important, and especially in a United States context, it's so foundational to how the system works, I think it's um, it's really important to talk about that. So um, now I'd like to kind of move on to the idea that racism and privilege are not really spoken about in legal terms. And here I'm gonna be mostly spo speaking from a French perspective because I'm not sure exactly, maybe Lisa, you can um, um, add information later about the UK or, cause I def I, I'm not sure, but from a French perspective, we definitely cannot measure racism, we cannot measure discrimination, and we cannot measure privilege. The reason why is because in France, we have deleted, we have erased the word race from our constitution. And I'm, I'm especially thinking of one specific bill called uh, La Loi Informatique et Liberté, which is the law for computers and uh, freedom which basically states that you cannot do statistics based on um, race or origin. Oops, sorry, some car is trying to come in here. Um, hello, Karina, again. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, because of this law in France, you can no longer, you can't do any statistic based on race, origins, or ethnicity. And this is a real problem because it really limits the visibility of discrimination and of privilege. And then I'd also like to talk about another issue, which I think this is more than just France. I've, I've seen this in the UK. Um, it's the question of diversity. You know, it's like trying to diversify the curriculum or trying to diversify our workplace or trying to diversify our teachers. And I'm, I used to be in this class where one time the teacher asked us, but diverse to what, you know? And once again, this is diverse to the white norm. So here, what, what's going on is that people are trying to do good, but they're actually really reinforcing um, white dominance. And I think that there's a difference between allyship and support and speaking for someone or kind of, yeah, speaking for someone. 
And so again, here we're really very aware of the danger of this concept of whiteness perpetuating this white dominance. But we also believe that hopefully it can be harnessed positively. And when I say that, I'm kind of also thinking maybe of um, exploring masculinity in order to fight a feminist struggle. You know, I kind of think that in a similar way, exploring whiteness can really help um, in this um, grassroots movement that is the anti-racist struggle. So yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We were on time, Lisa. That's yeah. the big bulk of our... Uh, yeah, we are on time. Yeah, look we at us. Um, we also want to say that we're about to open up the discussion, but we also want to say that after this on the Facebook page, on the event page, we're going to post like a document full of like resources that we found helpful. If you want to get involved with like, I don't know, direct, direct action and you want to maybe join some like um, anti-racist groups, we're going to give you like a lot of different information there to carry on. However, yeah, right now we want to open up the discussion. If anyone has any questions, anyone has any like input, then any comments, then you're more than welcome. So you still Honestly, don't be shy, guys. You need to unmute. Oh, All right. I'll start it off. Yeah, go for it, Chelsea. <laughs> you uh, guys did such a fantastic job. Like, I've, well, thanks, been, babe. Oh, I've been taking yeah. notes. Like, I've, I've been taking videos like a proud mom. You know? <laughs> 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 okay, so my first, um, it's more so a comment, and it has to do with the Soweto Township um okay sorry uh, the flint water example so um that struck with me because i i did a case recently which was or a few months ago which was like could i just men maybe mention what's going on in flint or do you want to oh okay you can go ahead go ahead um just basically since 2014 the city of flint which is in the in the um, state of michigan has no longer they don't have any drinkable water and the reasons why is ba basically because uh, general motors um emptied toxic waste in the flint river and um i use that example because that um it's a 65 percent black city and um there's like basically the activists from the city argue that this is environmental racism. I, I agree with them. And so, yeah, basically that's it. It's like disproportionately affecting people of color and um, destroying the planet and health, health, their health, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, go ahead, yeah. Chance. Yeah, so um, basically w when you mentioned that, it, it made me think of this one example that I did in um, my international law class and um well actually it's a comparative human rights law class so we look at um different human rights um systems in, in the different in different countries um and one of the examples we got was from south africa and it has to do with um soweto townships and soweto it i, I don't know if everyone knows about what townships are but they're basically um where black people were forced to live in south africa during apartheid and um apartheid sorry and um so the soweto example was basically that now soweto still exists like the township and it's right next to uh johannesburg and um it's also um not far from like some wealthy uh, suburbs um in johannesburg and the issue was that in suburbs in south africa you don't have to pay for water it comes like you know normally through the taps and stuff but in Soweto townships you have to go and and pay um to receive water at your houses and so the people were um suing because they were arguing that they're not receiving enough water like the right to water the right to um have that available to you um free to a certain extent before you're charged for it was the issue and um, what came up was that the infrastructure in South Africa simply just did not allow for the government to rebuild Soweto. So unfortunately, the people who live there um, will never be able to escape this method of dealing with their, with their water payments. Mm -hmm. um, and the argument also came up as to what is enough water to give to people for free um, simply because of the situation that they find themselves in now, which unfortunately can be changed. Mm. But I, th I think it goes back, you know, Esau, you were saying that we talk about like disadvantages and we talk about advantages and however, we just need to think about things as rights. 
and you know you're asking the question like how much water is there is is good to give for free but at the same time you know as Esau said we we should be thinking about these things as a right not not even as like no precisely like something that we just you know we're willing to give to people we we should live in a structure that you know allows people to to receive these rights and not term them as like benefits you know this person has to have it and this person doesn't so that's what yeah that's what it reminds me yeah it's precisely that and um i guess the fact that these people currently today who were born in soweto and had to deal with this problem um it's been a structural problem and and it's 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 a problem that was caused beforehand and unfortunately mm-hmm. it's, it's not something that can be solved now it puts them at a disadvantage mm-hmm. very interesting does anybody else have anything to say i'd like to add something yeah go for it I, um i wanted to add on something that um lisa particularly you you discussed previously on the topic of merit i think that that's a really interesting discussion because there's so many different aspects that goes into that and it's it's something that's been it's an image of success that's been constructed over years through various institutions and i did a study specifically on the french government and how the like certain vocabularies and certain words are used um to particularly construct this image of success um and it's very interesting because it's done in such a subtle way and the consequences of it is that it's essentially the government and these institutions are deflecting responsibility and they create a sense of shame and outcast for those who do not meet the constructed images of success in all these different domains and so that as well is a mental weight that they're posing on minorities and um certain communities that it, and it's 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 um just it's completely constructed and com- and it's so interesting in the way that it flows so easily in vocabulary every day just like everyday everyday sentences every everyday things that you would see like even like just like the world is yours on a blimp kind of thing that type of that type of conversation so yeah i just wanted to add that and say that that's a very complex um it's just a very interesting topic yeah yeah i think it's very interesting also like in specific i'm not american um, i'm not from the united states so i can't really speak for them but from an outside perspective you know when you think of the american dream the entire premise of it is the idea that you can do anything you know you can go to this land and steal it and kill the people and you can become whatever you want and it's which is that's basically the foundation of it and so it's just like that's mad yeah Mm -hmm. i have a question go for it serena so like relating to the idea that we can solve this problem of racism on like a collective level How do you guys recommend that in our everyday lives we can like take actions to make society less racist without like infiltrating the government or without like i don't know overcompensating how do you guys also feel like overcompensating relates to racism yeah i mean this is something that me and Esau kind of spoke about when we were putting this whole seminar together like how it's not so easy to put in like a direct like step-by-step guide on t- on t- on how to like solve this problem <laughs> i think obviously first of all just reflecting like obviously we're all part of the system so first of all we just need to reflect on our position how we are benefiting from it or you know maybe at the opposite end and so in terms of like small set scale things you can do you can like you know talk to different people about this maybe you see something problematic in your workplace or just on the street mm-hmm. and you know you address it in that kind of way um you know you can get involved with kind of like anti racist groups if you want to take it that step further i mean i guess it depends on your like i think everyone maybe has an individual perception of how we can emancipate ourselves from the system whether you want to take a very like radical approach and believe in like some you know revolution you know or you just or like re- like some intense like revolution or you want to you know just work at it by slowly kind of talking to people um i but don't also, know like, yeah it's, it's i think what, yeah i was going to say also just kind of maybe i mean we really struggled with that question and we were kind of like you know talking about it isn't enough we need to get people to like think about doing more and stuff but obviously we can't force people to do 
anything. But also I was thinking, you know, if you read like, um, first of all, I think informing yourself is a really good start. And then also like if you read like de what's called decolonial literature, that it's like a movement that comes from Latin America, um, it's all about decolonizing the mind. And that's, I think that's what we're trying to kind of get at here. I personally wouldn't like go around claiming that this seminar was decolonial, but you know, this is kind of what we're kind of tending towards. And um, I, th I just think it's a really inspirational idea, you know, to kind of think about um, undoing and delinking from everything that you've learned. And um, through that, maybe you can, I don't know, I don't know, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can all start the revolution, but I mean, <laughs> what you are, yeah. I mean, I think that like, is this this is this is a, a good example of how everyday people are changing the um, the or 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 rather like um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, the fact that you guys have come is already yeah. Yeah. yeah that's it. But it also come it also you know boils down to education and and being exposed to those certain you know. Obviously, there's a lot of communities that aren't necessary. You know, it, it comes down to like literally, like you, like you said, you said undoing everything that we've internalized. You know, and that that boils down as well to the education system mm. and what we're learned and what we're just what's ingrained in our minds from a very young age, right? Mm -hmm. Also, like, how do you guys think that our current capitalist system? fuels are like systemic racism in society and do you think that there's any sort of change while we have this economic system in place i mean so personally for me i believe that all of this is interlinked so obviously if we're to look at capitalism we're looking at an, a system of oppression so the only way that we have billionaires the only way we have these multi-million dollar corporations is because somebody is being robbed of their labor they're being you know, oppressed in, in some sort of way. So personally, like, I believe that with a system like capitalism, capitalism and equality are just complete opposites. Like capitalism is all about e inequality and that's race, that's, you know, class, that's gender, that's, you know, ableism, that is, you know, sexuality. So personally, I don't think that you can, within capitalism, we're ever going to see equality. And so obviously we can, we can look at other kind of modes. I guess as well, it's important to note that right now is quite an interesting time because we've got this whole COVID pandemic. We're really having to think, you know, people are saying, oh, I can't wait to go back to normal life. But obviously this kind of highlights the fact that this is not really viable. Like, you know, maybe this time we can all reflect and see what kind of um, structures we can work on, like, you know, what needs to happen. Because personally, I mean, I'm, well, personally, I'm an anti-capitalist, so I don't believe that capitalist, capitalism is viable. I don't think it's, it's good for the people, you know, you're robbing people, you're stealing things from people. So on that level, no, I don't think that we're going to see an end of racism. We're not going to see an end of oppression until we end capitalism. So, do you want to add? Yeah. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Yeah, hello. yeah uh, um, uh, that was great. Thank you very much. That was Thank fantastic. Uh, I have a question. Uh, um, just want to know if you, uh, if you have uh, literature around whiteness, but also uh, the question of uh, the nuances of whiteness. But it's much more subtle than, you know, than white and black. Yeah. Um, today, uh, I mean, you can be granted, you can be, um, you can be awarded as white person, white being black, probably, or being Asian, or being Jewish, as we have now, although they were seen as, let's say, black, so they have, you know, uh, they have gained whiteness, they have earned whiteness. Yeah. So, yeah. There, there must be some subtleties to uh, to that because yeah. today uh, people from Eastern Europe, for example, let's say Polish people, um, uh, are not really seen as white as white people. Yeah, yeah. But they they want they want to be white. It's kind of race towards whiteness. They want to be white. Yeah, I just totally, as much. Totally. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, just as much as today, you can be black and have white privilege. That's that's why it's so. Um, it is so 
complex to define whiteness. Because yeah. if you as a black person, you go to um, you go to Africa or somewhere in the global south, um, you still have that part of whiteness in you because cannot be dissociated with uh, uh, with your locality, with the West. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's a very important point here because uh, I want to... Um, I want to have your opinion on this and also see if you have some literature on the nuances of blackness and whiteness. So from my part, I don't think, um, I think maybe I'll let Lisa talk about your second point. Um, the only thing I will say is that actually I've been to Ghana and when I was there, so the, the word that they use to say stranger or to say white person is Umbruni. And I was there with an African-American girl and they always called her Umbruni, so, which is what they referred to me as. So, that's, so I think that really feeds into what you're saying, the fact that you st you're still different when you go and you still carry this somewhat privilege. So I think, I think that's interesting, but I'll let maybe Lisa or whoever wants to talk um, maybe answer that. However, what you said about the nuances of whiteness, 100%, um, I'm going to make like maybe a list of all the readings or interesting books that exist out there. And one specific one that I'm thinking of um, is, so there, there are loads, there are honestly loads, but one specific one is um, How the Irish Became White. So that's the name of the book. And it's specific in the United States, because we used to be referred to as the Blacks of Europe. Um, that has so radically changed. So it's, so it's really interesting to see how we went from working on plantations, not as slaves, but alongside slaves, and how that, <sighs> into us being um, a really important part of the white group and actually really, really, you know, um, playing a very important role in the perpetuation of racism. And in fact, actually, Toni Morrison argues that Irish, became, Irish people became white as soon as they pronounced the N-word in the United States. And so I think that that's, that's just so interesting. So, um, yeah, concerning your other point, Lisa or anyone else, do you want to go? Or yeah. I mean, I can talk about that a little bit. So, you know, as Esau said, um, if, you know, me, for example, or just kind of going to like a different country, like outside of the UK, maybe you, like as a white person, you're going to be in a minority. As Esau said, you know, she was outside it. I outside, um, like even me, like, for example, like I've just returned from Zambia. And so um, obviously like people saw me as an outside Side of they they called me like Mzungu, which means you know white person, and all of this. Um, and obviously, people with like a white complexion going to these countries, they're probably going to be called well. They're obviously going to be called Mzungu as well. But the thing is, in terms of kind of the racist structure of things, even because racism is kind of like a global system, and we can see that as we've spoken about like colonialism and slavery has kind of constructed this global system where you know white people are at the top and black people are at the bottom and so like in that I don't know if this answers your question question I think this is kind of what your question was about but in that still within um kind of countries within Africa or countries within Asia they are still kind of under um the laws of this of this global like white supremacist structure and so like, for example, we just need to look at things like skin bleaching in, in, these, in the global south. And we need to look at the fact that, you know, white people, maybe they're, they're, they're called out or maybe a racial slur or like, I don't know, Mzungu is used or all of these things. But at the end of the day, they still hold a privilege because of this racist global structure that we have. They're still, you know, I mean, when I was in Zambia, you know, I talked to some people who said that, you know, um, in my in my workplace, like as soon as white people come into the workplace, obviously this guy was speaking like as a Zambian. He said, as soon as like white people come into the workplace, they automatically get like the promotions. They get all this. Like we can be working like here for years, but still, you know, we we don't want to say it. Like as as Zambians, as Africans, we don't want to say it. But white people still do take a precedent. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Was that kind of? Uh, yeah, partly. But uh, you, as um, as a mixed race, so I don't know how to, you identify yourself. Uh, you in Zambia, you still had that white privilege with you. It could yeah. have been. Uh, I'm sure it was much less than the white people there. But you still had privilege in that. 
so yeah, um, and also that's interesting that you 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 mentioned the term Mzungu because it in my African language, which is um, dialect of Swahili, we also say Mzungu, and in Mzungu it doesn't mean white. Uh, it it means whiteness. Actually, it means whiteness. And, uh, in Zungu, it's not the color here, but your your being as uh, as someone from the, from the West. So uh, we have a we have another name for being white. Yeah, we say uh, something else. But uh, yeah, in Zungu, it's really whiteness. And I as uh, as a Afro French uh, person, uh, I would be called Mzungu in 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 my uh, uh, in Africa, for example, because I embody whiteness somehow. Yeah. Can I like add to that as well? Yeah. Um, I'm from Kenya. For all who don't know, but I grew up um, moving around, um, and so I didn't live in Kenya for very long. And um, Kenya, we speak Swahili as well. We use Mzungu. However, Mzungu means um, just just white person in Kenyan like uh, not Kenyan sorry but like in Kenya um and but I would say that I have been treated like a white like an Zungu oh. but um I'm because I've grown up elsewhere even though we would we would visit every year um because I sound like this and I would go I remember like last year I was with my cousins we were like in the we we're in my my mom's village uh, so we were in the countryside near Uganda and we go to like a nearby bar to have to have a drink and there's a guy playing uh, there's a DJ is playing really bad music and they asked me they say um Chelsea uh, go up to the DJ and ask him to change the song because he'll listen to you like and she meant because I sound the way I, she was like play up your accent she you know just be like hi I just flew here from Paris and I'm a like this is this is something that I did, but it worked. You know that is my white privilege in Kenya. Right. Yeah, I think that's, that's what you were saying. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that is really interesting. I guess as well. You know, we have this as well. Like within the global structure, obviously we have this. You know, distinction between countries. We have you know developing countries. You know, third world countries, as people will say, and we have you know places like the UK, Europe, and you know the US which within this structure they are kind of the oppressors and they are the people that you know are at the top of, of this structure so I guess maybe in in terms of this um, in terms of this global structure in regards to countries there is still maybe like a privilege of location of, of from of where you are from even if you know race does play a part like geographical yeah. location does play a part part as well mm -hmm. but if anyone wants to add anything that's a really interesting point yeah do you mind if i jump in there yeah i'm in the studio and i'm at working but thank you for sharing everybody i'm really fascinated by the discussion thank you for joining um, us yeah thanks there's a point chelsea just made i was really interested in and uh it was about how she experienced her own white privilege while she was ex um in in africa and, okay and then it, it made me stop and I'm like, is it a white privilege then or is it a West privilege? Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, are we, are we in danger of conflating an argument that isn't about white then at all? Yeah. There are some academics who talk about whiteliness, which is... Whiteliness, did I hear yeah, you? Sorry. Which is basically being given the attributes of whiteness, like any attribute that is um, originally associated with whiteness so somebody from the west like typically a white settler or something um taking those attributes and putting them on the person of color and yeah that's kind of maybe what happened in that case i like a point kamar made on earlier as well yeah mm. um, yeah um thank you i think that um i think that whiteness is it, well, it's through this through this conversation. We you guys have uh, mentioned it. I think that whiteness is a it, that's the best example to prove that whiteness is a made up construct because it's being applied to me, someone who is not white, and I think that's the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I find that really fascinating. Eh? I'm um, I'm quarter caste, but you know, in the winter I'm much whiter, and in the summer much blacker. And honestly. 
like I was brought up in a, a, much, a very mixed race community and now I live in a very predominantly white community. Historically, geographically, you can't. But, um, but my, my whiteness or my blackness is defined not by me, but by the community that I'm in at the time. For example, when I go to London and I'm with some uh, Jamaican friends, for example, they'll consider me on a spectrum of white to black very different than when I go see my, my white friends in Hackney, for example, yeah, or, or my Japanese friends. Do you see where I'm coming from? Yeah, 100%. Like, definitely like, the idea of a construct, because similarly for me, like, obviously I'm mixed race. I'm from a white area, but I've lived in London for like the past few years. Um, but, you know, where I'm from, because it's majority white, I'm considered black. Like in London, because obviously it's very ethnically diverse, I'm considered mixed race. And right. when I went to Zambia to see my family, I'm a white person. So it just highlights this complete, like, construct, like, you know, it's so contingent, you know? Literally defined by your location at the time, eh? Mm. And the privilege, like, a sense of status. It's not always the colour of your skin, it's... Sometimes it's like uh, uh, maybe the suit or the watch on your arm, regardless if you're black or white, that westernness. The definition between white and western then comes to play again, you know. Yeah. But all of this just kind of goes to show the absurdity of the entire concept of race, you know. Indeed, this entire, yeah. What we're talking about now, just how <laughs> it's so plastic, how it's so fluid, how it's always in movement through history, but also through space, you know. And... Um, I just think this is this is this is a very rich conversation. Thank you all for sharing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank uh, you. Yeah, I, I have another question to to ask you. You 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 mentioned the diversity. Uh, uh, I don't know who who did that. Uh, but I just want to have your opinion on on this uh, from both of you. Uh, I I do some training sometimes. But, uh, actually, I did two uh, diversity training. You know. Uh, but I don't do that anymore. I don't. Um, I was just trying because I think it's kind of a uh, uh, distraction from uh, uh, from what from the the issues of race, like uh, believing that diversity should solve everything. So what I say to to businesses or companies that uh, don't don't diversify is if you have not dealt with the issues of race because diversity trading is very superficial so it's about putting black or Asians or people of color in the company without really addressing uh, whatever it is sexism um, race etc etc so i just want to know what you think of uh, um, the issues of the diversity um in terms of what you said kind of about diversifying like the, the workspace you know i guess like filling quotas and this kind of thing like i think obviously like now the system that we're in is very like disproportionate in terms of race um as we said you know you're either advantage or you're disadvantage so in terms of you know right now in this space where we're not there is still like a lot of racism i think it is important to take like an active role to you know invite people into the workplace because you know otherwise like the natural well not the natural but the way that society is constructed right now we are like automatically not going to pick you know ethnic minorities so i think you know taking kind of an, an active role to like diversify the workplace obviously then you can't just be like oh yeah let me have like this group of ethnic minority people but i'm just still not going to change my perception about things i think it goes hand hand in hand like you need kind of a revolution of your consciousness you need to ruminate you need to like deconstruct your way of thinking and then again you need to act and be like okay we need to bring more people into the workplace we need to diversify kind of yeah the area and i think it's really difficult because um when i said that thing about diversity i was criticizing the concept of diversity and i, th I genuinely believe that a some of the most of the people let's say who try to implement these policies in their companies or whatever um they are trying to do good and i think for example in universities it's really important that we diversify the our teachers and our curriculum but um and but sometimes it can be really frustrating because like i don't have an answer to your question but um 
And sometimes, you know, I think people get really discouraged by comments like that one when I made it because it seems like we're criticizing everything, nothing works, nothing is good enough. And, you know, unless we abolish capitalism, nothing works. But actually, to some extent, as paradoxical as it sounds, I actually think that deconstructing things like that, even if it means criticizing them sometimes, is actually really constructive. I don't know if you guys um, get what I mean. But um, Maddie, you wanted to say something. Um, yeah, sorry, it was more off the point that I think Riyadh um, was making. But I guess it can kind of tie to this as well. It was about how, like, um, it was, I think when you were talking about like the kind of locality and like your location to the West and how that can then be conflated with whiteness, like whiteness and masculinity and like ableism of all kind of constructed like completely impossible standards, which no one can reach because that's kind of the point of them right um and then so i think uh, you were saying about like the suit you're wearing and the place you're in and the kind of like the kind of way that people have to chameleonize themselves um that becomes so much harder obviously based on how you present just based on your skin sorry i've kind of forgotten the point i was gonna make because <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like now we're done um but then with like deconstructing something like diversity as well like it makes sense to kind of think about that as well because if there's an impossible kind of thing which is completely built on structures and layers which no one can quite place themselves within then how can you like represent a group of people no matter how diverse they are within that because you're working off of a framework which like is illogical mm. that brings a fascinating question like uh, just a, a point of thought in in a hypothetical example somebody from bangladesh moving to france how long would it take them to obtain westernness or whiteness like, do they ever is it possible it? is it possible yeah, yeah. yeah I've obtained it personally i think i obtained it when i was about 10 when i moved from kenya to singapore and i was kind of thrust into to singapore was that sorry yeah um okay. and i was kind of thrust into whiteness in an international sense um as opposed to like in a in and I say in international sense because I mean that um, I, I went to international school and everyone was diverse and so and everyone was also very privileged and so I think that the whiteness became the privilege it didn't it, it was no longer the skin color and it became your external like kind of um, shows of whiteness so are you going clubbing are you wearing like i don't know a juicy couture <laughs> jumpsuit uh, the things that were fun at the time that were um expensive for kids at the time. i kind of want to also jump into that and just like confirm what chelsea has said but also like bring a bit further because i don't think we can actually speak about whiteness or like white privilege or so on without talking about migration which is like very great point that you brought up here but like also from experience I know, for example, I've been here living in Germany for maybe five years now. And like I have also family members that have been living here for longer. And for some reason, like they are considered white, if you like from a like back home perspective, because they have been living like in Europe for like, I don't know, 20 years or more now. So kind of like they're they're being whitewashed. But at the same time, like when you look at it from like an European perspective, like it's also like the same like with French, like we still talk about like second generation French, by the way, just like not call them French, for example. No, because they're coming from like the Maghreb and from like needed Algeria kind of like colonization more perspective. So it's kind of like still, you're never really a white person, even though that you actually confirm to kind of like this kind of like what you talked about Chelsea, that like, okay, now I can do all the cool stuff that white people do. So I, I can go clubbing. I like, you know, I do everything that like, you know, from my backward culture tradition are like supposed to so I do exactly the, the opposite of that so I can just like cool down this performance and then I can like I can pull out this like white performance and hopefully by then like you know you can be just like a bit have like a bit more status in this like whiteness layers and privilege yeah but I, I think that's like a really good point and I think like 
we should also make a distinction between whiteness as kind of like maybe a superficial or like a symbolic label as we kind of said before and like whiteness as an institutionary like thing so I mean obviously I'm going to speak from a UK perspective because you know that's what I know um, but people like feel free to jump in but obviously like for example as Chelsea said like you know if you start hanging out like um, with like the privileged people of society and all of this and you know you feel white you kind of feel you know akin to all of these people around you like um, at the same time just because you have black skin you're still going to be disadvantaged like institutionally so I think yeah with, with this whole conversation we need to kind of realize like symbolic versus kind of like actual like material but obviously it's quite interesting to hear people talk about like different like geogra geographic locations because you know I as I said I'm, I'm just speaking from like a UK standpoint and I don't know you know how it is in other places but we definitely need to kind of focus on you know racism whiteness as an institution and, and whiteness is kind of just like a label like oh this person's so white yeah, I should I should reiterate just, you know, for context for everyone who doesn't know me. Um, I'm from Kenya, but I, I grew up moving. And so um, I've had the privilege of not being directly discriminated against because of my race. But um, I feel like um, my exposure to whiteness has been more symbolic, as Lisa is saying. It's like whiteness as a status symbol, almost. Um, yeah, but also I think this is all very interesting because it kind of just goes to show how this is all about how other people see you. And I think it's really interesting in the case of blackness versus whiteness, um, especially in the United States con context with the one drop policy and everything. We, we, we put this blackness on people, we impose it on them. And um, I was reading about this recently and I, I, maybe I should have known this before, but it was really, um, I learned that in um, the United States, I don't know about Canada, but in the United States, um, indigenous people have to um, prove their ancestry to some extent in order to get something called an Indian card, which, give, which basically, if I don't, if I've got it right, gives you the right to live on reservation and access the reservation and stuff. And I thought that that was really interesting because in some cases for namely blackness we force that down people's throats and we kind of impose it on them and then in other cases it's all about self-identification and you actually have to fight in order to be recognized as fully who you are and so yeah i just wanted to put that out there because i thought it was interesting food for thought hey guys do you mind if i ask a question go for it evan Hi, uh, yeah, so um, anyone who doesn't know me, I went to uni with Izzel and Maddie and stuff. Um, I'm from South Wales. And um, first off, I just wanted to kind of say about how, like, it's been a bit of a jarring thing coming back to Wales um, since I was in Brighton. When, it was the, like, when I was in Brighton, that was the first time I ever, and doing the course, the first time I'd ever heard the concept of whiteness. I'd never, it hadn't featured in my consciousness before that point and it's been like it's it's almost been like uh, and um a bit of context i've started a journalism course now um in in cardiff and bothered me a lot the fact that a lot of the concepts that i was working with and that i had kind of started taking taking for granted um was sort of unlearned when i came down the m4 um and now you know we had a massive like you know we have we had a i i think my main point is that we're talking about this concept of whiteness and we've obviously mentioned intersectionality and stuff like that um and in a place like wales where diversity is not the norm it's an exception to the white norm um how like me personally and as a journalist as well how i have that conversation with people who their whiteness, their, you know, their, their, their privilege is, 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 is so taken for granted as to be invisible. Um, yeah, I just had, wonder if anyone had any sort of thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's 
it's definitely a good point like it goes back to you know what Esalt said like you don't even realize because you're at the center of it you're not really forced you're not the other but so you're not forced to kind of look at you know how you're benefiting you know earlier as we said when we think of racism we look at the oppressed rather than the oppressor rather than the privileged so I think yeah definitely people are, are just unaware you know they are definitely unaware of like the privileges like how they are advantaged but I don't know if anyone else wants to add yeah I have a little oh, sorry after you no you go you go ah oh, please please Evan hi it was um yeah I, I spent a small amount of time in the Gower in in South Wales oh yeah and I was really 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 fascinated there because I, I met a lady who saw me in passing with my mother who's uh, she's half caste but you know over there she was black because it's a very very white area yeah, it is. and she 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 turned around to me and she said oh I've, I've never seen a black person before but I've seen many brown people around here so like in the the caravan and camping community that went on the holidays there they were predominantly French German English and they had a couple of Asians but she very much differentiated brown from black I asked her a question of whether she differentiated between whiteness, whether there was like if she saw herself as different to a German or a Polish, because she was an old lady, you know, mm. and she very much did. You know, it was mm. she didn't she didn't see white and black as we knew it. So her privilege could never have been white or black. It was English <laughs> or and German and very national kind of. Mm. It didn't that is to be so white. interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting like actually one of the readings that i did for this seminar was kind of talking about like even within whiteness i know we've talked about it a bit you know the introduction of kind of like jewish people the introduction of irish people into whiteness but even now like the guy i think it was like steve garner who was kind of saying even within whiteness today like is there is some sort of like hierarchy in a way like are we all on the same or like are white people all on the same level of whiteness it's definitely like an interesting yeah, yeah i think it's really interesting i think emily you'll um you'll remember this so emily and i used to live together and we used to live with someone else who um who was romanian and he so emily and i did similar studies so we talked mm -hmm. often studied what we're talking about here and um and so we were to some extent literate on the matter and it was really interesting because when we did engage in conversations with him he as a romanian he would always say but i feel racialized i don't feel white i feel eastern european and i feel working class and that is my identity and when you're telling me like that oh you have white privilege it's interesting because to one extent maybe you could see that as white fragility what I was talking about earlier and like, you know, getting defensive when your privilege is pointed out, but also in a British context as a Romanian man, is he really considered white? So I just thought it was, um, it was just really interesting to talk with him because we came from very different um, perspectives on that, but I don't fully disagree with him either, you know? I'm, su I'm, I'm super curious to throw that back to Evan uh, from a Welsh perspective coming here from the UK like um how much of the romanians man uh, can be played into the same context i mean i've met people from north wales who have a very different idea of uh, privilege from an english man for example yeah it's there's a very interesting kind of i mean this is the whole thing about overlapping things right in that there's a massive center periphery divide between you know the the south in the uk and the regions um and that's sort of, I guess, kind of what I meant about the conversation about privilege and white privilege is that I think in the valleys, in in uh, the west of Wales, up in like, you know, uh, fucking um, real and stuff, some of the most deprived areas in the UK, like the conversation about white privilege jars a lot because they see they don't see any... Um, markers of their privilege um and i think you know also we've had this kind of this whole anti-establishment kind of uh wave in the uk and the us and i just think that at the moment it's very because we're not really in control of the concepts ourselves because these are things that have been basically handed down to us they are you know we are both we are all sort of heirs to this kind of weird fucked up legacy um that people aren't really therefore literate 
of them. And, you know, for example, the fact that whiteness has now become a concept, you know, um, this guy called Kaufman talks about the white shift, that white identity has become visible, you know, at this point in history, it's now, there's almost like a, a, a pushback, you know, and, and you get, you know, um, right wing voters and stuff pushing back against, um, you know, civil rights um, rhetoric and stuff, which, which is, so, so I think that's the really sort of crazy thing to me is like, you have a lot of things that can basically be used as, as, as counter narratives to, you know, what we're talking about in this room. And, 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 and that, that sort of, that concerns me, I think. Can I, can I yeah, add? Well, I think like, I, when I have conversations about racism um, with white people, um, granted I've had the privilege of like, you know, speaking to people like this, who like, you know, uh, we also have, we're also acknowledging the fact that this chat in general is privileged because we have the education and the resources to get to the point that we are at, obviously. And the computer. But, gosh, <laughs> nothing broke. <laughs> Just a plug fell, it's fine. Um, but I always, I always see it like this. I see it like racism, has a very simple definition. It is the institutional oppression of a race, um, whereas discrimination is personal oppression. And when we understand what institutions can do is when we properly understand what racism is doing to people. And I think that that's more of what we should be doing right now. I don't call people personally, like, okay, so I, I, I do human rights. I like to like have these conversations with people and go around and be like, as a black feminist woman, you know, and um, try, to, try to seek out the people who um, want to have this conversation, want to disagree with me, but want to learn. Like, they're just like, I disagree, but I, I, I want to learn. And um, I think in those cases, that's when, and it's up to you to decipher what those cases are but in those cases that's when you can go oh hey um instead of calling you a racist i'd prefer to just be like okay um have you ever been discriminated against because of your race if the answer is no then you have racial privilege have you ever been discriminated against because of your sexual orientation if the answer is no then you have sexual privilege and etc yeah i think that's a, that's a good point uh, i like the point of uh, 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 racism versus uh, discrimination i also make the point about um, of racism uh, versus prejudice um, and that makes me uh, the, the whole discussion around race it, it gets me really tired because people have very reduced definition of racism, which is, as you said, uh, all said, uh, political oppression, social oppression, and prejudice is kind of, we all have prejudices, you know, black people have prejudices against Asians and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, that makes it so productive to define racism as, as simple prejudice or uh, discrimination. No, um, so that, that's the point I wanted to say. And I also um, um, wanted to talk about um, uh, mental health issues and whiteness. Um, and I, I feel like sometimes in the discussion, we, we get into that kind of discussion of prejudice. We associate whiteness with a very, very uh, superficial thing. But whiteness, it, it it kills, it harms people, it causes mental health issues. Uh, in whiteness in public spaces, it is harmful to, to people of color, uh, to black people in particular, but people of, of color in general. So I just wanna hear uh, uh, probably all of you about the, the issues of mental health. Uh, I don't know if you, some of you work with that, mental health issues, trauma and race. Yeah. Because that's something that I'm that I'm studying now, uh, as a uh, I just uh, 
independent um, independent scholar, but uh, probably some of you know a bit more than I know. Um, I'd like to just a small comment on that. For example, indigenous communities in Canada have the highest rate of suicide in the entire country. And that's a problem that isn't necessarily addressed, it is ignored, and a lot of those times those communities don't even receive the visibility or have the social aid um, yeah. that they need to be able to not only support each other, but to get themselves out of those situations. And um, it comes back to a larger question on how, um, you know, we participate on an everyday basis um, in, you know, into those everyday practices and in those institutions that allow for those things to happen and to instigate it really. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, on that, I just wrote it in the chat. There's a really, really good poetry book by a, an indigenous uh, Aninishabe person from, so that's Southeast Canada, right? Yeah. Um, and Northeast United States. Um, and the book is called Islands of Decolonial Love. And she really addresses um, issues, uh, mental health issues within um, her community she addresses ancestral trauma and um i wanted to say something else and i can't remember oh yeah and she actually writes passages uh, uh, with her therapist and it's so interesting because her therapist is a white woman and she says oh i hear what the white lady wants to um i hear what the white lady wants to hear i tell her that i'm just a poor indian blah 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 blah, blah. and it's it's very I, I can't do it justice but it's um it's a hard book but because it's poetry, you need to kind of like poetry. I mean, it's prose, but um, but I highly recommend it if you're looking into ancestral trauma and stuff. I'll also add it into the chat, but there's also a book by Lee Miracle, who's um, an indigenous woman called, and the book is called I Am Woman. And it does discuss particularly um, certain mental health issues within the indigenous community, particularly in women. That's also very interesting, so I'll put it in the chat. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, I wanted to know your guys' take on cultural appropriation in relation to this whole uh, discussion and theme, because I thought it's kind of like, it's very oh, tangible. Help, sorry, help me out here. Cultural appropriation. I'm not, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't get much schooling. <laughs> Define like, it for me. Basically, when one culture takes um, the ideas or aspects of another culture and um, embodies it themselves so, so they're like, kind of like um how it how cultures merge more so like i guess like we could... have british people here going lol because of american television 10 years ago right something like this or <laughs> <laughs> i think maybe, maybe someone else is a, a better sorry <laughs> it kind of like come um you know coming off of on that well, I can't speak. But basically, cultural appropriation is more about um, a culture within or a race that has like more privilege in society. You know, taking from a, a race or culture that is oppressed. So it's kind of like you know, um, say if a white person, for example, festivals. That's a really good example. Um, I don't know if you guys are like familiar with festivals, but like for example, I go to like a lot of UK festivals. And you'll have, you'll see a lot of kind of white people wearing like you know, Native American headdress. You'll see them maybe wearing some like traditional, like, I don't know, Kenyan like t-shirts or, or all of this stuff. So it's kind of, you know, somebody in a privileged position, you know, taking to some, from somebody uh, who is a group that is... So sorry. So the word appropriation is like to be appropriate. I, I kind of get no, it. It's bit. more like appropriating something that isn't yours. So mm -hmm. I think the Indian, well, the Indian headdress is a good example because each feather, I, I, okay, I don't know enough, but I believe that it has specific meaning. And when you're putting something that has, it's supposed to have a spiritual purpose and you're just putting it on kind, basically some people interpret it as very, dis, as disrespectful. Okay. I think another good example could be um, white girls wearing bindis at festival. Oh, I'm getting the gist of it, thanks. Yeah. And then Ali, what I want to add is just um, to answer your question, Ali, I don't think I'm in a good position to talk about this, but I think what is interest, what is important is perhaps when one is profiting from cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. On an individual to individual level, 
I'm not sure where I stand because I'm white and I don't think it's I'm Irish. I don't think my culture is appropriate. I don't think we have much to appropriate really appropriate <laughs> us, really. But um um and on my French side, everything we had created is stolen. So that's a whole other question. But but yeah, I think when money comes into it and you're taking the you're st- like you're making money off something that someone else in a more disadvantaged position could be taking on a credit. Well, yeah. I, if, yeah. if I may add, uh, I heard a, a caller saying that uh, there, there needs to be a position of power for someone to culturally appropriate. So it's. Oh, can you say it again? Sorry. Oh, oh sorry. Could you just... oh. So, so it comes from someone being in a position of power, taking cultural traits mm-hmm. from, uh, from a, a, a marginalized culture and then not crediting them for it. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I think that's, that's a big thing is yeah. you might not take profit out of it, but you're never crediting the, the, the culture. Yeah. And I mean, you always take profit from it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when you're wearing it, it makes you look cool. But if someone from that culture is wearing it, then they're not integrated enough. They're not, um, they're being, they're going to be made fun of because they're wearing this or something like that. And so even if it's not on an economic basis, it can be on a capital, social capital or cultural capital basis. So like, it can be just about your image and how people are going to perceive you. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, as what you said, you know, if you're in a dominant position, then you are, as you said, attached with labels. Like, oh, that's cool. That's different. And I want to give an example. I can't remember which um, fashion brand it was, but this was a few years ago. Um, somebody, if they know, um, you can say, but a, a big, like one of the big fashion brands that we know um, did a runway show and they had their models with like dreadlocks. And they basically said, you know, we were inspired by like the 60s, like hippie movement. And then everyone called them out and they were just like, you know, you, like dreadlocks is quintessential in like black culture. And so at this point where this this fashion brand has so much power and they're not, you know, kind of referencing the correct space or they're ignoring the fact that, you know, dreadlocks and black culture are just like intrinsically linked, then it's kind of like problematic. And like, yeah, I guess like on an individual level, um, it is it is still like a problematic thing like if you're you know for example you don't understand like the culture that you're taking from that you don't understand and I think as well going back to like a white fragility if you kind of you know you've read up on where this thing comes from and then you know you still want to like wear this thing you have to be realistic and accept that if somebody from that like um, minority culture calls you out on it then you just have to accept that you you can't argue back because it's really not your not your place to it's not your culture to to argue on um i want to ask a question about white fragility actually yeah um i mean there's sort of like and it kind of comes back to sort of what i was saying about um about like people who aren't aware and like people who like you're kind of effectively bringing bringing the conversation to them um i wondered how we how we um harden white fragility in the sense that how we make people more receptive to a conversation and i think there's an added element to that wherein as because people haven't been aware of their of their white identity when it is challenged um the fragility is kind of like it's kind of a thing of um of 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 being exposed and there being nothing there you know like in the sense that because it is it's it's a take for granted privilege like i think there's almost like a kind of an existential um existential void a bit which i think kind of feeds into the fragility so i just wondered how yeah like and i'm talking again from a kind of peripheral Welsh perspective, how, you know, I have that kind of conversation with people without kind of feeling like I'm treading on eggshells around people's fragility, basically. If I can like kind of clarify on what it is you're trying to say, my friend, just yeah. to be absolutely Go on. It's like, are you trying to say, how do you tell somebody something they're not aware of almost? 
Yeah, it's it's how do you tell them something they're not aware of? And right. then as I, I said that. before about with the election, from the Brexit election. and all this kind of stuff, people have that sense of fragility and they are quite happy to therefore cling on to um pretty like like pretty um regressive ideas because of that like because of that feeling exposed, because of that feeling challenged or or or, or in some way victimized man i've seen this from both the black the white and the middle community man <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a, a tough question yeah i think it's really hard and one time if, um two years ago when i was um uh i was back in france and um we had this conversation for those who know those who know you know we were in the chalet this, that's all i'm going to say so we were in the chalet and we were talking so we we're in a place in france and we were talking about we were basically organizing something called a privilege walk and so it was what we wanted to do was line up everyone against the wall and um just say a bunch of sentences it was quite it was quite violent and it was just like say a bunch of sentences and people walk more or less depending on um their response to this to the question so it would be like are your parents divorced have you ever worked um do you pay rent whatever you know and so the point was that the game was rigged so that white people and maybe more like able, um, straight, whatever, people would be more at the front. And so the reason I'm t telling you this is because we had two people that were, pre when we were organizing this, we had two people that were present at the table and it was massive um, head to head conversation. Well, like they were bumping heads on the topic. And uh, one of the people was white and he was saying that we had to be really delicate in how we address the topic and that we had to be kind of gentle and not aggressive in our approach. And the other person was a woman of color and she very strongly disagreed. And she said, no, I'm sick of, uh, you know, being kind to people who aren't kind to me. I want to be aggressive to say these statements loudly. And I could so see both sides and it kind of feeds into your question. I think, you know, it's, it's like, I totally get it because I'm white and like when I talk with like my family and things like this, I, I, I can afford to walk on eggshells when I'm engaging in these conversations, but not everybody can and not everybody wants to. And I don't mm. think that people of color necessarily, yeah. love this. but this yeah. again, it's your position, how far you're willing to go, the emotional labor that you're willing to put in. So that's, uh, yeah, that, that's a good point because that's how, uh, that's exactly how whiteness um, harms, harms people of color. Mm -hmm. We are uh, often told how to say things. Um, and uh, the problem in academia is just, uh, uh, it's also this, that we need to, to, um, to be in control of our emotions uh, so that we're not hurting white people. So that uh, we need to educate white people what to do and how to do uh, because they are too lazy to to look for their own information and that's that's terrible that's what causes um uh traumatic experiences mental health issues uh, among people of color uh, the fact that we have to uh to keep our emotions for ourselves i mean the 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 thing about the the anger a black woman who's who's always angry that comes from there because mm -hmm. uh, we are told to suppress <laughs> yeah. our emotions uh you know so that we can uh, we can please white people. We you need to make them comfortable. Yeah, that, that's problematic. Yeah. I was just going to add on that. I was going yeah. to be like, you know, it's funny because while you guys were talking about this, I was thinking about, you know, this is so funny because this is how, these are the things that I consider before having a conversation with a man about sex, about sexism. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I think that these are just the issues that you, <laughs> Counter, like the awkwardness, the emotional investment, how much do I want to apply to it? These are the issues I feel that you, you just, you encounter when you're dealing with the, the person who's winning in the kind of oppression Olympics, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but it seems like at this point. I, 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 did, I, I, I do think. Have like a left field question for like everybody including everybody who hasn't spoken. And I know that a lot of people were in CV um, Laurent's uh, class for, um, so basically to give some context, um, I went to Sciences Po with Lisa, which is why I'm on this call. 
and um we and just many did, others on this call by the way uh, yeah and many others as well I, um and um, a lot of these people were in um a class that i wanted to be in in the first semester and the second semester which had to do with like the african diaspora in the u.s and um the reason i bring this up is because it was taught by a white woman called sylvie uh, laurent and um uh, I actually, for the record she's one of the prominent french thinkers on um whiteness there's like three books in france written on whiteness and she's one of the people that wrote one so yeah she's very qualified for the position as isolt has just said um and so i actually had a conversation with a friend of mine following france um kanya to those who know her um and i said to her i i told her i was like you know i i really want to be in her class she in isolt and isolt uh, Isolt and Lisa would come home every day and they'd say that, you know, it was inspiring stuff. Isolt had a crush on her. I really want to be in her class. I think she's doing good work. And um, Kanye's point was that she's taking, in summary, um, she's taking the place of an equally qualified Black person. Yeah. So I extend the, the question to the group of everyone who was in, in her class or just like anyone who has an opinion on this in the entire chat. Um, do you feel like she was taking up the space for an equally qualified black person? And if so... You could ask the same question about me right now, I think. <laughs> it's true. No. I was going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize everybody would go quiet. <laughs> so I just wanted to jump in a little bit, like from, uh, so I was born in South Africa. It's a great talk by the way guys and like a little bit of what you guys were all talking about before about when you go down back to africa they all think you're western so like i've lived away now for like over a decade so now i get called english when i go back and it's kind oh, wow. of like derogatory and like i'm offended by being called english like i don't want to be english i'm not english might be like i might have a british passport but i'm not english right but anyway, you know, the issues in South Africa and everything involving ground race are just so complicated. You spend hours about them talking. But then, you know, and like sometimes I think that we've got to consider the sort of like economic kind of elements of it. So again, in South Africa, it's quite complicated, but there's like great amounts of poverty. And it's very hard for people to sort of be able to relate to someone else or think about their own whiteness. And maybe this is a bit like what Evan uh, was touching on about in Wales like you know if you're living in a small place you're not really feeling any benefits and maybe you don't even actually see that many people who aren't white you know it's very hard to relate to like something that is still an issue and you know you're involved in it somehow but I think the best way is just you have to get people having conversations with each other like, it's all about just having a conversation so people can like relate to one another anything that you can find to relate you know and just sort of have like you know something that everyone could move forward together in sort of unison because i feel a bit like everyone's quite isolated these days in the sort of capitalist world we live in you know especially right now it's like a perfect example we're all stuck in our rooms on computers imagine if you didn't really have anyone like in your immediate friendship group who didn't regularly challenge your views like you know i i know you sell so I get to get involved in this but you know many people might not you know have anything even close to this or you know i've i've had many of those theories before i studied sociology but you know again if you've not encountered any of this before there's no reason that you'd be able to easily accept whiteness as a thing you know and um, because it's not you can't just you know in south africa as well you've still got all the rich white people and they now basically there's even a whole town it's called Aranya, and it's like an all white place and they just consolidate all the economic wealth over there basically for that little group and generally speaking there's a lot of private enclosures so people live in sort of fortified towns effectively and that's mostly white but there's also black people there and you've got to also remember that you know like apartheid ended 25 years ago now and it's been the same party in power the ANC, the african national congress is an all, all black party They've been in power for, you know, 25 years. And now the situation of people in the checks are even worse. And like there were lots of droughts recently, particularly in Cape Town, and it got really bad there, particularly for the people in checks, because, you know, there's uh, government water stations were given around, but then there's so many more people that need to access it in the shacks. 
but it's much harder to actually get the same level of access. And the problem is still obviously the existing historical racial uh, sort of, or, you know, just racist government that was in control for literally hundreds of years, effectively, right? And that kind of marginalized people, that's why there's these shanty towns in the first place, right? But now the problem is that this capitalist, but or black African government has not actually solved the situation, but generally made it worse. So, you know, I don't know how we sort of solve that problem, but, you know, there's also maybe some way, I guess, everyone needs to build and work together to sort of work it out somehow. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Can, I, can I talk to you about South Africa, right? Yeah, so, good. Yeah, they've been, they, they, the ANC have had control. I'm South African, by the way, as one there. Oh, okay, um, yeah. Yeah, the ANC have had control for 25 years, man. But yeah, what, 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 experience do you have to run a country after being ruled over for hundreds of years what experience mm. do you have to, uh, to actually to build the infrastructure yeah. to, to start providing for the townships to start moving water supplies and to start building roads and stuff you don't have that experience they're doing what they yeah. can but you know was, i think i think that brings a solid question like kind of bringing the two points there together is like how much of our equality this racial and otherwise is ever going to be sold outside of economical situations. I mean, the ANC is a great example, but I can think of one when I was working in the refugee camps in Italy, a brother in Syria came after working from Bahrain and he was explaining to me the lack of potential equality there. It was a similar situation in a totally different world. And I'm curious in every aspect in America, in England in France for, for all colors and all measures, how much of this goes back to, I've forgotten the OP's name, I'm sorry, but goes back to the capitalist measure of it. How much of it is economic equality? Our friend here just made a really good point about the ANC um, it, and almost incompetence of 25 years of study because they, they, they haven't got, how do you say, uh, the, the, the long-standing structural, infrastructural, global network that this white Western world has, how do you say yeah. it? given to so, the Dutch before they declared their own independence. It's almost, yeah. been, it's almost been forced upon them. We haven't given them the support they require to flourish, right? We can accept this in a way. Yeah. Uh, but I feel quality, like, sorry, sorry, carry on. Sorry, I, um, oh, please. I just kind of feel like the discussion when it comes to, and that, I think that this discussion has kind of taken a detour into just um, African politics and kind of the the transitional constitutions of developing countries yeah. all right so my question i think is like how, can we how much is capitalism a part of this equality no i understand that no i i mean um the initial point um i i feel that how can we undo what has been done for centuries in 20 years is the first is is my my initial point yeah, yeah. um not for you for uh, the guy who initially brought it up the south african guy yeah uh, um it's not possible to do that in this amount of time um we should remain critical because that is that's good that that in that encourages people to do things to enact action but i also feel at the same time we have to maintain and observe um perspective because when we're looking at transitional justice and for everybody who, who doesn't know what that means that just means that all of the countries that around the 60s mainly african countries that got in that got independence had to had to rebuild their constitutions we have to understand that for centuries i still have to remember all the time that england is so old because kenya isn't and as much as I've grown up and moved around and all this, blah, 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 I'm Kenyan. My culture is Kenyan. My, my point of reference is where's Kenya at in reference to this? What are Kenya shillings in reference to a pound? Like, where is my street in reference? To, what is, is, is this what a house would get me in Kenya? Like, you know, I'm always comparing it to where I'm from. And where I'm from started in the 60s. And that that's my only point that 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 needs to be understood by more people yeah, uh, can, I, can i add something so, yeah you can go you can go 
Okay, I just want to go go back to to uh, to, to whiteness and uh, what white people say to to get me uh, to get me angry and make me tired. Uh, things like uh, uh, let's start a conversation. Just what I what I what I've heard now. This gets me so frustrated because conversations that it's what we've been uh, we've we've had we tried to have for, for, for centuries. And what we say instead of uh, let's have a conversation, something that we always try to do, it's we say to white people, and here I'm including white liberals or good people that were here, is instead of saying that, is listen, listen to what we have to say. It's not let's have a conversation anymore, but listen to what we have to say. And then another point that I, uh, I want to ask to, to um, Sorry, to Isa. Isolt, uh, please. Yeah, Isolt, uh, just want to hear more about your point about whiteness in France, because uh, me being from there, uh, for me, the most, the most racist place that it could be in Western Europe. Uh, it's France. Also, yeah, for me, it's France. So the France, even if you look at the, uh, the history of, um, of uh, the Enlightenment in France and uh, uh, the racial theories, um, uh, the cent centrality of it is from France and Germany and a bit of Sweden, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but more France. So I just want to hear your point of view about because uh, you compare a lot with the United States. Mm -hmm. I just want to hear more about. Uh, I, about I agree France. with you, and I've tried to have this conversation with British people, especially. Well, it's mostly been when we talk about the veil. Mm -hmm. I've said yeah, France is like so backwards compared to everyone else in Europe. And I said to um, one of my British flat flatmates, I said, you know, isn't, don't you think that the UK is kind of a little bit more on top of things in, when it comes to that and like just discrimination of um, Muslim women, and, like control over mus Muslim women's bodies and stuff. And she said, no, you know, it's just, um, it's almost like it's more insidious in the UK. And so I'm not sure how true that is, but I agree with you. And actually, I think that the French system defined the US system and the US system defined the, you know, they kind of both right. each yeah. other. And I think it's really interesting. But also, like when you look at French um, Caribbean colonies, it's a very specific situation. I don't feel comfortable talking about it because I really don't feel like I know enough. And I'd rather uh, someone from there, so a, a Creole person or an Antilles person expresses themselves on that because I wouldn't have the means to. Um, right, so, hi, I'm from Italy. Um, I went to uni with Isolt and Tristan and Brighton, but um, I came back to Italy and I'm, I mean, I haven't been to France that much, but I'm pretty sure Italy is just as backwards, if not more than France in regards to races. I mean, we still have a convers. I mean, there's no conversation on the use of the N word in Italy, yeah. okay? I can't, That's true. it's something that really frustrated me. Um, I mean, I think, is Evan still here? Yeah, um, just like he was frustrated going back to Wales. I mean, for me, coming back to Italy and then suddenly having to have all these conversations over again that for me were pretty given um, was really frustrating, but then, um, the point Chelsea made earlier about um, your professor taking up the role um, that an equally qualified woman of colour could have taken made me think, um, is it my, I mean, is, do I have the right to make this my fight in Italy? I mean, am I, I see how I, it's my responsibility to do something about it, but is it my fight and am I taking away someone, someone else's space? to fight that. Um, I want to know what you guys thought about this because it's really a dilemma for me. Like, I'm, I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure I have the right to be making this discussion in Italy. I would just like to say, um, um, Lara, that um, I, uh, during this conversation with Kanye, we had arrived at a, at a conclusion um, which was that we one we had a difference of opinion. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and um, Kanya, we also arrived at a, an opinion based off of context. And so Kanya is a Black South African woman um, who 
who grew up in South Africa entirely. She's been subjected to a lot of racism to do with her complexion, um, despite her privilege. Like, it, nothing, nothing matters, you know? Um, so she felt very strongly that um, Sylvie Laurent, the teacher, was taking up a space. Yeah. And I, I ended the argument by saying that simply because I don't have your experiences with racism, I don't feel that she is. Mm. And I feel like we need to be, black people like me, need to be expressing ourselves more often. Black people, but then also like the different types of black people. We're not just one but, type of people. Can I, can I chime but in? But then it needs, uh, so like we need to be expressing all the different ways that we feel hurt and all of those ways need to be understood. So for example, I don't feel that Sylvie Laurent was taking up a space simply because she, she was interested in this topic. She understood her place in this topic as somebody who is speaking on an, on an experience that she never experienced herself, but she wants to give light to the situation and she wants to use her privilege to end the suppression. I think that that is a fantastic oh, yeah. use of whiteness. And I would never say that anybody who is, is taking up a space, if they're doing that. Granted, you don't have to do that to take up a space, but you want yeah. That's yeah. Um, I just wanted, just really quickly, the point in Italy is that people of color do not have the space. They virtually have no representation in the media, in nothing. In Italy so like that's another different thing respect to the UK for example or France even like there is people of color have virtually no possibility of expressing their opinion so that just makes it that much harder I think, that, I think that kind of ties in well with um, what Evan was saying um, the stuff that I, I was wanting to speak about um, in the sense of uh, rep representation and numbers and uh, who's saying what I think um, I'm coming from, from a personal place when it comes to like culture and having a voice. Um, I have to somewhat disagree with Chelsea because you know I think that so much goes into where you stand and how you feel personally when you're when you're being questioned or when you're being attacked. Um, you know I think for me uh, all the things surrounding my identity. You know being British, being Jamaican, being Turkish it's so displaced like who i am is so displaced that when i'm being attacked for any of those things where do i go who do i turn to what do i have to stand on and sometimes i think i think also being british um which turns into uh, what Issa was saying about how you don't know how it is wherever and also what alara was saying about how we voices i think with the british is quite dangerous because we're so we're so beaten into not saying anything we're so beaten into uh, staying quiet and sort of putting up and shutting up that I feel like that is so hard driven into who I am, that that is so conflicted with my blackness, is so conflicted with my Turkish side, and everything that I heard growing up. It's like a whole mishmash of everything. So I think when it comes down to you wanting to say something, I think you can work to, you know, you can work to your, your, your advantage in the terms of likelihood and, or, sorry, like, um, likeness. Um, so who you're talking to and what power it holds who you are. Does that make sense? Uh, so as Evan was saying, um, from it coming from his voice and his 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 body, I think it would really connect and really um, so I think wanting to learn about and wanting to understand race issues come from within. It comes from an individual's point of view. So you can't really change that in anyone. You can't force it onto anyone. There's no amount of shouting or you know article posting or whatever. So I think just um feeling confident and feeling secure enough in yourself and like with the right intention, I think um, I think your passion will show through. And no, can I, I, I you know, please can I jump in there, Jay? Because I, I'm going to love and and agree and disagree with what you've said there. I mean, taking back to what Lara said, it, does she have the right, therefore, to to go and make that fight her own? You know, and what what you've just displayed there is like I I agree. In Britain here, we, we are kind of semi-repressed, but I also find the most the, the best part about our country is how open we can, and it's increasing day by day how we can have this conversation um, and how we, colourful we can be about our cultures, you know, segregation aside. To, to Lara, I'm thinking, how does that apply in the Italian sense? Does she have the right, therefore, in a place where, because it's very different than Britain. I've seen 
in Milan, you know, you can barely find a bench to sleep on at night. In Britain, it's not the same problem. We don't have scours of Africans covering every doorway, every bench. It's a very different world. The voiceless, they call themselves out there because they can't get a work permit. They can't go home. Um, they need somebody to fight that fight. But is it Lara's place to then go forth and fight it? It's, it I it's think a, it is. As somebody who is applying for jobs in the UK right now with a Kenyan passport and nothing to fall back on except the grades that I've gotten in my universities, um, I'm, I'm reliant on good white people to speak up. And I feel like we should always leave space for allies, especially for the fights that we don't know that we're fighting as black people. We are connected because of our blackness, but we are not one because of our blackness. And my experience of my blackness is very, very different from I, f I feel like a, a lot of a lot of people who I've I've had conversations with. I've never, f I feel like as a, as a teenager, and this isn't maybe as we, like Isos was saying, when we talk about um, feminism, we should have more conversations in masculinity. When we talk about whiteness, we should have more conversations with black, about blackness because um, although whiteness affects not only black people, it has been kind of reflected as such. Like it's like some sort of like, white versus black struggle and black people are very vocal about um and i would say african-american voices are more vocal mm -hmm. about how racism has impacted them mm -hmm. but i'm here to tell you all that i've experienced ignorance as a black african woman from black african-americans mm -hmm. so it's not about your skin color it's not about your it, it, it like your racial experience in kenya as a black person will 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 not impact you in the same way as your racial experience in the u.s as a black person will right right I totally and agree. so these are the complexities in blackness that i feel like people don't understand and i don't i this is the thing as somebody who has the who has the privilege as a black person to not have to experience direct racism racism that that angers me racism that 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 rightfully um would not make me have this opinion i feel um i think that that is that should be considered in the conversation as well and that should also i think reflect on the white people who are doing good the allies that we need to be encouraging to continue their work absolutely, absolutely. in what they're doing because guys as much as it's affecting us it's affecting us in unique ways and we need to work together to all together benefit from 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 this issue for, like from alleviating us at least from this issue lara there was a beautiful thing in italy with um we took 20 clowns from milan all white and we took them to foggia where we we taught africans who were selling vendors on the street and we taught them how to do clownery and miming acts some french some italian uh, forms you know things they'd never seen before and then we displayed a show every night to the children of the schools in the local area. And of course, you know the area, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a racist area. Yeah, where did, you, where did you work in Milan? I was in Foggia uh, for oh, okay. a Don Bosco project. But uh, oh, okay. I've, I've done some projects in Milan. We took some clowns down from Milan to Foggia mm -hmm. and some international volunteers from all over. We uh, worked with Gambian and Malians from the streets, oh, yeah. taught them how to do clownery and mimery. And by the end of seven nights of the street, performing to the people, they were singing, dancing, and holding hands. You have the right. You have the right. And even what more you have, you have something to share. And of, uh, can I add something to that, Terry? And of course, they have the, uh, she has the right. And uh, all the white academics have the right to do so. Uh, the problem is, is that we cannot do much as people of color. We cannot do much against it. Uh, when I see personally, when I used to study 
uh, I used to study post-colonial studies. And then every time I will, every time I'll have uh, a white person uh, in uh, a white academic in, um, in those fields, like let's say if I have an option about whiteness, then I will leave the place. I'll leave the, uh, that's the way I, I, I do. I cannot say, um, this is not to say I'm against uh, this white person being there, but I'm against the institution, the whiteness of the institution. So uh, we, can, we can say, okay, we're okay that white people do their stuff, it's fine, but we can be against the institution. And it comes individually or collectively. As, as an individual, I just leave the place. Uh, this is to say, I don't agree with, the, uh, with such a system within such field as post-colonial studies or critical race theories. Uh, another example is uh, every two years, uh, there's a conference called Afro-European Conference. Yeah, I don't know if some of you heard about it. So it's uh, supposed to be uh, Afro identities and Afro-European studies. And what we see for six, seven years, it's a great number of white academics coming to lecture black people about race and uh, all kinds of stuff. So now we started to say, no way, we're not coming back to that. We're not coming back to this kind of, uh, of, um, uh, of conferences. Uh, it is that way because we're renting the place, we're renting white institutions, and that's problematic. Um, so what I do and what some do in this kind of conferences, every time a white person, white academic starts his conversation or his or her lecture, I just leave. This is to make a stand that I'm not here to listen to white nonsense or white institutions. And this is not against the, the, the individual, but against the institution itself. Yeah. That's something. I think I to mention here, I, I, I agree with you. Sorry. Yes, I've just been trying to make a point with my like, oh, sorry, Go for it, go for it. <laughs> before, before I lose my call, but no, 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 everyone is like making a pretty interesting point. Um, but basically, I just want to say that in terms of kind of, you know, Lara, your question, of do you have a place, you know, to talk about this issue? I think there's a distinction between you know, speaking for somebody and then speaking alongside somebody. So as a, a white person, yeah. you can't, you know, just expect that you have all the knowledge, like just roll through into, you know, the white community and say this, this, this. You need to kind of be aligned with, black, with ethnic minorities and listen to them and build up your knowledge from kind of what they're saying and then go in alongside them. So I think, you know, for example, you know, we're talking about Sylvie Laurent, like, you know, she does have a lot of knowledge and it's not like Sylvie Laurent is just in a space of, of white people and she's just, you know, only in the, her white elite bubble. You know, she's, she's very much like within, um, she kind of, you know, she's in a circle of, you know, academics, which are people of colour. She's, she's around, you know, different people, different voices. However, if you're just like a lone white person and you feel like, you know, you want to like, you know, give kind of your ideas without joining, aligning with other people, then I think there is a problem. But, but I do think like, obviously in this struggle, we need white people to speak up. We need white allies because, you know, at the end of the day, people of color are oppressed. So their voices aren't gonna be heard as much as white people, which is a sad fact, but we need people in, in those positions of power to help us to, to kind of change the situation. Yeah, I, do, I totally agree. And I'd like to say two things. First of all, obviously, I'm very much talking from a white perspective. And the question that you asked is a question that I really try to ask myself all the time. I'm really careful, to be honest, about asking it to, I often ask it to white people, um, just because I don't know, I feel it. I, I don't, it's a personal issue, whatever. But I think the first point I wanted to make was one, if we learn, and as we, as somebody said it, or I think, yeah, uh, when Serena earlier asked, basically, what should white people do? Um, learning and listening to other people is, I think, a really important part. And as you just said, Lisa, not speaking for, but, um, you know, kind of harnessing the work that's been done by, like, for example, in this um, 
in the seminar, we try, okay, we, we used Robin D'Angelo, but we tried to specifically use people of color's work rather than white men's work or white women's. Um, but also I'd like to mention um, something that happened at COP25. So you guys probably all heard about COP21. It was in Paris. It's this big climate, um, like, yeah. anti um, <laughs> it's this big, like, anti-climate change um, white institution that was created. Um, I think that was in 2015. I think, Emily, you went there. And... Um, so there was another one in Madrid in, at the end of 2019, and it was COP25, and Greta Thunberg got, um, she was given the, the, um, the space for, I don't know, uh, maybe like 15 minutes or something, and she spoke for like a very brief amount of time, and then gave the, gave the floor to four other indigenous, um, to four indigenous women, and I thought it was, that was the, it, it's a it's kind of a good answer to your question because that's a white woman who has a very strong platform and people really listen to her, but she's also, um, she, you know, she put, she gave her floor to other people and she could have just read out a speech, you know, but she kind of, I don't know. So I thought it's not really my place to say, but I thought it, that was kind of true allyship. And I was just like, God damn, you're 16. You're so like, you're on top of shit. So yeah, that's it. Yep. Okay. Does someone want to ask? <laughs> um, can I can I can I chime in if nobody else is going to? Yeah, go for it. Please fill um, in the blank. I don't want to. <laughs> um. So I kind of have like it's almost half a question. Um, I think it's almost linked to this in terms of who has the right to say something, who is um you know making the right point by saying something, and I think something that has been a bit of a like a confusion is are these like uh social justice groups um specifically ones that i've had problems with are antifa and xr um based in the uk i'm talking about um and um obviously these are personal issues that i have i've had with individual people um but i find that when i have conversations with these people about issues that i'm coming from from my perspective they, they're often quite lost um in the um safety of their community and the community's image and what the community stands for. Um, and they're almost blinded by um, sort of uh, the overall ethics of the good that this um, group is trying to do. And, you know, they can be almost being completely dismissive of a perspective view um, compared to, you know, anything else. Um, so what do you think you can do when you're talking to someone who has um, the sort of moral group identity behind their back, um, which sort of almost rids them of being at all uh, an individual thinker or individual, um, individual um, what's what I'm looking for, uh, critic of their own social group and, you know, their thoughts or defaults. I think white fragility comes into that quite a lot as so. well. Mm. I mean, I like how you kind of brought in Extinction Rebellion because um, obviously, well, from my point of view, like Extinction Rebellion are quite like, problematic on the terms of race. And even, I don't know if anybody has actually watched, there's like a video by like the founder of Extin Extinction Rebellion like, like some months ago, like quite a while ago. And he was basically talking about, um, you know, how, you know, basically the, their practice of you know, we all need to get arrested blah 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 it's you know it's it's fine to have like a night in a cell blah 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 anyway um obviously like that's problematic in terms of like a race perspective but going back to like what jade is saying i think you're kind of asking like you know these people are kind of sanctimoniously because they're in these groups they're saying you know i'm on the right side even though you know you can say something that may be problematic however they won't listen um in terms of that i feel like you know just because you're affiliated with extinction rebellion just because you're affiliated with like antifa doesn't mean that you necessarily that you're not free from like problematic views and i think i still think we need to kind of condemn these views and we need to open a discussion with these people because just wearing a badge you can wear a badge and you can be fake but um i guess it comes down to like people that you know will speak but they, they won't listen and I mean, I don't know, I feel like that's kind of like a personality trait. 
but we should still kind of question them because as I said just because you wear some sort of badge it doesn't mean you're actually you know free from you know to be honest like none of us are like at the pinnacle of kind of where we could be nobody's like completely like you know 100% clued up we can all learn from hearing different people's perspectives we can all learn like every day we're learning and so I think you know we have to acknowledge and people need to acknowledge that you know none of us are fully like 100% right on anything we're all sharing opinions so we just need to like obviously listen to people and obviously put hold people to account um yeah yeah preach yeah <laughs> also can i just like I, I haven't said it yet but thank you fucking angels for creating this beautiful safe space where we can all just come and talk about this tonight this is so wonderful like thank you so much <laughs> thank you NHS. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, um... like it's been so it's been really easy to feel like very stuck because obviously we are physically um and i feel like my brain has been kind of just like going into a into like slug mode and it's been kind of like hard to kind of connect with like these things and obviously because you're not connecting with people where you can have these conversations all the time and, and like, i don't know this is just yeah i'm feeling a little more waking up tonight which is cool <laughs> yeah i mean then again i could have never had a conversation of like tristan in brighton Isolt, are you in paris like this would have not <laughs> happened so it's really making me appreciate the situation to be honest uh -huh. we would have never done this <laughs> in any other <laughs> situation Tali, did you want to say something oh yeah um <laughs> so i'm just i'm i'm watching from zambia actually and um there's some dope stuff <laughs> you know international um, we have people from california vancouver france oh, yeah. wales some dope, views, um, Sorry. some dope views here so um yeah um so the fact that we are all here discussing like this thing that is like something that most people don't want to discuss um i just want to like uh, ask a few just like maybe two questions like Obviously, we are like civilized people, you know, like we and we're tired of all this, like the separation. I mean, personally, I'm tired. Like, I don't want to see, um, I don't want to see this separation. I just want us to live in the world, in the world, like, you know, as one and like in peace and harmony and, you know, just like perceive each other as equal beings because that's what we are. So, um, Obviously, we would want to change something, change uh, the whole thing, and we would want. But what would we? But what would I say? Like, um, what would we? What are we willing to do? What? Uh, to what extent are we willing to go to change this whole thing? You know, like what? What steps are we willing to take? You know. Yeah, I mean, I. I just wanted to jump in there on that like i mean i feel like this is maybe that opportunity that we get at, overall as humans to sort of you know let go of or not let go but sort of move forward in a productive way you know we have such big problems facing us right now you know like climate change and like this massive disease going around and stuff you know and we're seeing how it's disproportionately affecting the south and people of ethnic minority backgrounds in the UK, for example, there's like a disproportionately high back, uh, like death rate and stuff, you know. And there's these big problems that, you know, especially now with this COVID, you know, I feel like this is maybe an opportunity where people, you know, and I, I appreciate the whole point on conversations, you know, going on endlessly, but some people just don't get contact with those kind of uh, outside views. And this is finally something that, you know, every party can relate to you know everyone you talk to from here on ever is going to remember this and you can make a joke about it right and so these kind of these big issues that we're all going to like band together and like it's not a question of sort of how far are we willing to go it's like we don't really have a choice like we need to start sorting all of this out now and i get that point on the xr people you know they get a bit overzealous in that kind of way and they've got their own problems and i would just point out that they you know they have stated specifically you know, in the relations sort of uh, people saying you know that is 
more risky for you know people of ethnic minorities to get arrested they specifically said you know if you are at risk of that don't do that like they're not asking people like that to go and get arrested they're asking the people who are you know 50 they've had a fantastic middle class white british life the whole time they've never done anything wrong they have literally nothing to lose to go get arrested so that's who they want to go kind of <laughs> distract or that you know we're in a different time now so anyway and also just a little quick thing on south africa as well i don't i don't um think that you know it's because the anc is like completely incompetent or anything and uh, like my uncle for example works at the african leadership academy in Joburg, and this is like one of the most important things because if you look at the uk you know this like oxford university is older than the united states of america and they've had a course PPE, like philosophy, politics, and economics for over a century now that literally fine tunes people to be politicians. Like, we don't have that in South Africa. You know, the fact that we've got people that I love the current president, Ramaphosa, he's doing amazingly. Like, I think he's fantastic, you know, but he's never really necessarily had the same kind of access to education that people here have, you know. And you've got to just kind of keep building that up. Like, this is where, you know, in South Africa, again, it's just there's so much poverty and destitution that we've got to just do something or you know what there's no other choice basically in my opinion anyway on that cheery note <laughs> well, maybe we shouldn't be talking about whiteness or blackness at all maybe we should be talking about oneness you know to your original but that's what yeah. we were saying about colorblindness beautiful oh, yeah and i completely agree with that you know you, you gotta you gotta <laughs> you, you have to know where everyone is <laughs> Yeah, um, I just want to say that um, uh, that was great. That was great. Thank you very much. And um, uh, my last point would be uh, all the white people here, are, you, you, you're doing a great job. And for me, the, the, the job that, um, that allies uh, do is to take away the overload of emotions when we do some kind of lectures or conferences when we talk about race. When we have a white person um, there as an ally being able to, uh, to talk a bit more about what we uh, what we try to do it, it, it's a great help it really a great help um, when I do uh, some talks now here um, w one of the first things I start to say are uh, you white people you are all racist and then everybody's shocked everybody's shocked because we are all ra white people are what all racist just as much as men are all sexist because we cannot dissociate um, racism from patriarchy from sexism and so on and so on and then white people start to listen to listen to me from that point of view uh, so we should be bold when we talk we shouldn't be afraid of uh, of hurting white fragility uh, we should say things as they are and we hope that more white people like you will be will be with us that's uh that's, so that's great thank you for 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 doing that yeah. thank you because it's emotional labor you know like yeah that. it is but i think tala your question was almost um what sacrifices are you willing to make and come out what you're saying i think totally yeah. into that it's totally the same idea and i try to do that you know not be afraid. and it kind of goes back to what i was saying about should you be aggressive or should you be more like gentle with the white fragility but all of this makes me think of um something that we were talking about way 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 earlier um when we we're talking about white privilege and there's this passage has anyone read the book well emily i think you have has anyone read the book girl woman other so emily has Chelsea and Lisa, I've recommended it to you too. You two have to read it, but everybody should read it too. It's a really good book, which um, is written by a woman called Bernadine Evaristo. She, and basically it's 12 um, stories that are separate, but that are interrelated. And they're just um, 12 experiences of black, they're just 12 black women's lives. And um, each uh, chapter is seen from that woman's point of view and it's just really beautiful because it's like it just represents the diversity of um black female experiences and or non-binary experiences and it's a really good book i highly recommend it and this is not really on topic but it just made me think of that um there's a passage in that in that book where these four um black girl, it's the second chapter emily these four black girls are all friends and they have one one white friend and one the main character says to the says to the white friend you know um 
basically she kind of educates her about race and stuff and she this girl is like very she she's really not um aware of her privilege and stuff eventually she does become aware of it and so this black girl says to her white friend um now that you hang out with us and now that you're the fifth member to our to our gang um you're going to lose some of your white privilege and i just kind of wanted to ask people what do you think about that like yeah what do you think i actually completely disagree so did i <laughs> I completely disagree. White people who hang out with black people are cool. Like, like they're perceived as cool. And it's like, oh, you have black friends? Cool. That's interesting. And that, uh, that actually goes back to uh, cultural appropriation, you know? You always have uh, a white friend wanting to be black. And then when uh, it's about getting the best job, then you're the first to get the best job or to get yeah. into the... It's black by convenience. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's appropriation, intellectual, uh, physical appropriation, uh, cultural, everything. So no, blackness is a thing. I would disagree. And I want to add something, actually, that w we didn't talk about it earlier when we were talking about cultural appropriation. But when we appropriate, we only we, we select, we're selective about what we appropriate because, right. you know, it's all fun and games to listen to J. Cole and Kendrick Lamar or whatever. But when it comes to getting arrested and going to jail, Right. We're not gonna like, be there. Where yeah, where where are the whites? You know, so it's um, so yeah, I think that it cultural appropriation is actually quite an interesting conversation on on that kind of point. That's like, that's like a whole nother issue, like this whole yeah. like harassment issue, because that's now told and kind of a whole appropriation issue of its own. Like, where does that fall into it with uh, people like Exar, like um, individuals there finding it uh. Uh, a respectable trait to be arrested like you know it, it's, it's almost like there's, there's so many contradictions it's, it's so hard to know you know I feel to put a uh, priority around what's being too sensitive what's okay and what's not okay this is why I think this whole thing like there's no right or wrong way to go about it really I think because it is so uh, individual sort of uh, case by case um, I think where we all want to go is really in the right direction but for me, I guess the only way I see getting there is from cooperation, from working together, from sharing experiences and you know, being able to um, get out of your own perspectives and then take on someone else's issues in their perspective and want to be there with them. Not sure if I heard everything. Uh, I think what we're just saying was yeah. just kind of like that cultural appropriation is a personal is a personal thing like your definition of it is personal yeah, yeah it is what i understood i feel like sorry um who was speaking just now? sorry um, i know i was i was not sure what what i understood from that uh, um yeah. i like lisa uh, and east Lush and i have had many discussions about cultural appropriation and i feel like i've just kind of arrived at the conclusion that i i don't know and I feel like, guys, everyone on this call right now, the person who knows what cultural appropriation like is, can somebody <laughs> just, yeah, can somebody just pipe up? Like, no, as in, uh, um, yeah, and, 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 exp and, and define it. Because like my idea okay. of personal appropriation, of, of cultural appropriation is not shared practically, specifically. Like if you were a dashiki, I'm not gonna be offended. If you go to Kenya and you wear our national dress and you come to our wedding, I'm not going to be offended. If you wear our national dress in general and not and like not necessarily put it on your Instagram caption, I'm not going to be offended. Okay, okay. I'm always, I'm just grateful it's out there. I'm like, cool, you like it. Fantastic. It's supposed to be shared. That's yes. how I work yes. in my culture. And that's why I don't personally feel attacked when I feel that, when I see that someone is embracing some aspects of someone else's culture. But I respect the argument. I never, like, you know, I respect the fact that people have their own independent experience of appropriation and that's what influences their opinions. And that's why, like, I take a back seat with the conversation of appropriation in general because I understand that my voice doesn't have to be the loudest one. But I do also have to say that I I don't care 
Okay. It is, yeah, it's, 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 like it's like become the sorry. Go ahead, Sophia. Please go. On. Uh, it's like it's just this conversation which has just completely taken like has just been put so much at the forefront of conversations about race. And I mean, obviously, because it like its meanings go deeper than just like a white girl wearing a bindi at a festival because that like that's just a visual symbol of it but it's like yeah obviously we've like discussed and like picked it apart like a bit um but i feel like it's because it's this like very like obvious like taking of like two distinct cultures and like placing them on top of each other in a way which seems jarring because it's a white person taking for something like it kind of it's the way that that conversation has taken up so much space is it like in as much as it's kind of accessible because it's like visually obvious it's also i feel like, like quite an alienating thing to keep not alienating it's just not necessarily the right conversation to keep having because it's just it's repetitive but it doesn't like we still haven't like understood it can i can i reply to that i completely agree i think that what it what it often does is it places like normal people against each other is the intention a lot of the time when you're talking about halloween costumes and stuff the intention isn't there directly to offend the, 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 the idea is a purely visual purely aesthetic thing i'm dressing up for this one day for this one celebration i want to feel like i'm not myself it's just a costume right obviously the problems there are profiting like you're, you've got a company who's profiting because they're selling a native american costume whatever right but I think that the, the, the kind of like the media has focused in very heavily on this idea that, you know, cultural appropriation uh, is a discussion where it's not so heavy of a discussion. The more important things are like legislation that disproportionately affect people. You know what I mean? I completely agree with you. Because when you're talking about university students, you're talking about, you know, two groups of people, both at the beginning of their lives, both just trying to figure things out. You know what I mean? And it's like, Halloween costumes and stuff. I don't see a, a situation. My point is, I don't see a situation of cultural appropriation. You could go as far to argue um, that a girl wearing a Chinese dress at a party is cultural awareness. Maybe somebody from that party had never I seen a Chinese that. dress before. Maybe that. they've never heard of China. I would not. I'm trying to. I'm trying to strip back any political motivation behind wearing a, an outfit. I'm saying that it's a purely visual, purely aesthetic thing. You enjoy the patterns of the cloth. So yeah, 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 yeah. That's my point. I don't that, think it's that's about appropriate. Uh, uh, appreciate yeah, yeah. culture or appropriate. I'm just saying it's on one level. It's not about race. It's just about purely visual aesthetic clothes. You know? Can yeah. I jump please, into that, please? Yeah, please, Lisa, yeah. go. Profiting yeah. from someone yeah. else's idea, and I think um, as a white person with privilege, if I I'm taking something from someone that's making me look cool or that I think looks nice, but I, but then that community is not profiting from the fact that I'm profiting from them, then that's not cool, you know? Like, if I'm gonna, then if I want to wear a Chinese dress, then make sure that I'm buying it from a seamstress whose who's, who's, um, cultural or like, ancestry ancestral craft it is right and i'm allowing well, her to i just kind of feel like it's that practical, I do. you track the supply chain of all the products that right. you use today wear a badge to say where it was made you know like, no, can so, i add something can i, I add something unachievable i think that when it comes to like our own Who's goal sorry right. who's speaking who <laughs> <take it>? no. <laughs> no no go 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 Nermeen has been trying to speak for ages. So <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. All right, put my hand out. And then Chelsea, okay? Just like very quick points. Oh, has... last to go. <laughs> <laughs> Just like a few points on like saying that, for example, that it's purely aesthetic. I fully disagree with that because like it's as if saying sports are not political or like art is not political so i don't say i don't like i don't understand why we should like make an exception for this one and just like to take an example for like for example like carnivals here in germany are just like a big thing and then basically like, like people dressed up and everything and then like this one like big carnival that was like where like um we're living at the moment and then there was like few people like wearing as like fully kind of like you know with the niqab like this fully like 
like black covered like um like yeah uh hijabi women like they do in saudi arabia and like some other people like wearing like you know that the other sort of like also like saudi arabian kind of like men's kind of like costume and i was like thinking to my other friend and saying this is literally the only time in the year when you can dress up like this and not be judged for it because like it's just for fun and i'm like that's like so hypocritical for me because obviously we're just like gonna pick and choose when like we're gonna like be allowed to wear or like act in a certain way and just like to add more for example like for like i also take a lot of issues with this cultural appropriation it's like are we talking about a context where we're just like there's a culture trying to dominate another culture for example if i see israeli like people trying to like you know more or less like for example just like try to appropriate some stuff like homos or like some kind of like, like food or anything i'm kind of like also very enraged by it because like here is we're in the context of just like trying to like we're using this culture appropriation to dominate another culture and this is like why for me like of course like we're not going to judge anybody for like for wearing some sort of stuff or like i don't know what they're like kind of like attitudes they were gonna they gonna have for some sort of like you know like clothes or not clothes but i think we should always like question why they're like wearing them and if they understand like the roots of these things otherwise it's just like another form of like colonization i'm sorry but like this is how it feels for me like i'm not gonna like let this just like pass by and say oh someone there thank you for like uh, appreciating finally 50 years later like my culture not seen as like inferior to yours and like now just like you're seeing the beauty in it so yeah and okay I think great okay what's it like you know, with this discussion of, you know, cultural appropriation, kind of, you know, where um, you said go pal about, you know, these people go to the party and they're not thinking, you know, I want to go and oppress some people. They're just putting on some nice clothes. But it goes back to the question that racism is not necessarily like, you know, for example, a white person that goes and get a, gets a job, you know, in place of a black person because of the color of his skin, it's not necessarily that he's you know trying to oppress the other person it's not even necessarily that the employer is trying to be like oh you know you're white you're black so let me you know give you a job job and and you know not hire you but the thing is racism is so like intrin intrinsic so even if you don't think you know like oh i'm actively doing this you're still like feeding into that system and and, and racism is still there so i think you know like per, as somebody who has a privilege you need to kind of think about what you're doing because while it's all fun and games for you like i don't know there's black women who are wearing braids and and they get you know um said i don't know they people say you know this is not professional you shouldn't look, look like this blah, blah, blah. and there's white people wearing braids and they say oh you know you've got some cool style blah 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 so even if you're not like actively or consciously thinking about it this is the whole thing even whiteness it's not like we're even consciously aware of it but it's still it's still there but yeah right like, great can, can i can i yeah uh, yeah i think um um there i mean and lisa just uh, said everything about, that i wanted to say so yeah so i disagree with the uh, with the with the other points uh, raised earlier so cultural appropriation it's uh, so if we don't understand it uh, as a power dynamic that we don't understand racism, how it functions, uh, because uh, cultural appropriation, it's not about individuals. Of course, I have many white friends and uh, Asian friends uh, who like being black sometimes and uh, vice versa. So it's nice because uh, it's a question of individuals. But here we're talking about uh, power dynamic. We're talking about industry when we talk about music for example uh, let's take uh, Eminem in, in rap music he's cool because he's great because he's white although the music uh, is being done for decades by black people but because he's but because he's white because he can rap as a black person then he's great the same with Adele uh, Adele uh, because she has this great voice of of a black woman, black woman voice, then she's great. Then she's granted all kind of uh, of award of uh, prizes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's problematic. The same with uh, the question with uh, Palestine. Uh, what about the wine house? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the 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 question uh, the same with uh, the question uh, with uh, Palestine. The the kefir, the the hummus. It's about the erasure of the Palestinian history and colonization so they make it cool to make to erase the history 
and the coloniality of, uh, of Palestine. The same with black women. Today, it's cool to have a, a big bottom, big lips, etc. But these white women are the first to uh, deny the humanity of black women. So it's, it's much deeper than being uh, that individual appropriating something that he or she likes. But I think that like, I guess, and I want to, and I totally hear you, everybody who is, who has spoken, I think you guys have all made like fantastic points. And I don't, I don't disagree with the points that were in opposition to my initial one. I'm more so saying that when it comes to our current conversation, and let's say we have 10 minutes to talk about race, I would leave cultural appropriation out of that because of its individuality. And I think that's, I think that's ultimately my, my general point. I, I, I like your perspective. You I think that, like, I mean, essentially what you're saying is it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a bubble of an effect of the wider situation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to say, Kamal, about like, like what you were saying about Eminem and stuff. I don't know, man. Um, like, there's no point looking at things in that perspective. Eminem, his producer was Dr. Dre. It's not like he ever appropriated and never gave respect to the black community. The black community openly accepted him for their, yeah. their ranks. I mean, he was a unique individual. He, he brought his own artistry, his own perspective. And that's what music's about, it's about embracing but, everyone's perspective. But like, it's, about the, it's about the industry, it's not about the person as Eminem. We can, we, I can say Elvis Presley, I can say Bruno Mars, I can say many. Well, of course they are great musicians, but how the industry uh, rewards them as great, of so course they are. Let's talk about the industry. Let's talk about the industry, because mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the times we're very quick to blame institutions. Whereas, um, which is which is succinct, and I think that, that that's good. But we also have to remember that institutions are collections of people, um, and they're collections of people who are driven by capitalist um, intent. And so, whatever's selling will be will be pushed by, in your example, like the music industry, let's say Bruno Mars, whatever's selling will be pushed in whatever way that it's palatable to audiences, right, by these institutions. Let's talk about private companies, not governments. Let's talk about like, like non-state uh, non institutions, right, non-state actors. They're going to be pushed by that because they sell, right? We want to sell ideas that we know the majority um, um, is palatable to, now, it's not to say that when Elvis popped up, all the white people were looking for an alternative to rock and to feeling sexual. It's just that the white people don't and could not relate to black people, so they simply don't look to relate to black people. You know, when you're not trying to hear news, you're not trying to see ads, you put a block in, and that's that's happening that's consistently happening all of the information that you're receiving is is filtered through that block and if that block is your race then you have to consider how your race has filtered your opinion on everything black white yellow whatever mm, yeah and i think you know kind of what everybody's saying it's important that like, you know chelsea you're kind of talking about the institution like you know that individual he needs to kind of or he or she they need to kind of point out you know where like the origin of the thing that they're you know appropriating but the thing is like it is like racism is kind of institu well it's all institutional so even if you want to kind of you're inspired by something you know well okay my thoughts i just lost my train of thought but Okay, yeah, this is what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about like the difference between like appropriation and appreciation. And so I think within this, you know, Go Power, you were talking about Eminem, the fact that he's around like um, the black community. He's around like, you know, Dr. Dre and other like black artists. And so, you know, they've kind of big, bigged him up, his, his bigs them up, his bigs up, you know, black culture and all of this. And so I would say, you know, this is an appreciation. Like, it's not like he's going out on his loan and he only has white friends and then he's going to make like a mixtape and just say, oh, like, you know, rapping is for white people. It's not like that. He's kind of, you know, done it alongside the, you know, the, the black culture of it. And so I do think, you know, 
I mean, like, you know, at Chelsea, as you said, me, you and Esau have had these conversations so much and like we can never really decide on anything because it's just so like situational and it's just, there's, there's, there's really no concrete answer to this. But I do think that you can appreciate a culture like, you know, if you yourself have maybe, for example, like maybe a white person goes and they um, goes to Zambia for like, I don't know, a few, like, five years they live in Zambia for five years and then you know they they start um I don't know wearing like traditional Zambian dress because um kind of people around them have kind of encouraged them you know you know you're in Zambia blah, blah, so let me wear some traditional Zambian dress then I would argue that that's more of like an appreciation you've been around Zambians you've been in that culture they're kind of there saying oh you know try this on blah 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 and so I think it's a very kind of like gray area it's just like you know, who knows where appropriation ends and appreciation ends. But I think there is definitely appreciation and appropriation. Yo, I just want to say, you, the way that I see it is like all of these things kind of like point to the, the same one thing, like cultural appropriation, what we're saying about like industries, different specific industries, is that like, I don't think that there is, I think we can kind of agree. I mean, we don't live in America in, 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 in backwaters where we, we face discrimination every single day, or at least I don't think that I face discrimination every single day. I don't know about your guys' big experiences in England, but like, it's really us against corporation and corporation interest, because it's in their interest to like, in some way divide us, keep us worried and keep us buying things. Do you know what I mean? We're not, we're not, we're not against each other. We're against different corporations that have different interests. Like there are companies that make all these fucking um, indigenous headdress, or there are companies that will intentionally direct what we were saying about music. Like that, like Elvis is a great example because there are companies that will intentionally repackage everything that's good about black music and present it in a more digestible way. There are companies that will do that for profit and they have ruthless intentions and absolutely no care about the, the long-term effect. All they know is they need to make a, a short-term profit, right? So I don't think that the problem is is individuals against individuals anymore. I really think it's a capitalist problem now, and what we're dealing with is a class problem. We're all working for class what Eminem presents. I'm not trying to talk about Eminem. I don't listen to him anyway. But he was a working-class person growing up amongst other working-class black people and other ethnic minorities in the place he grew up. And he used to talk about his perspective, right? It's a working class perspective, not against corporation. Because those are the only things that are oppressing us, dude. People around us, the EDL, these are all small pockets of people. You know what I mean? Like small, um, racists are they're a minority now. Most people want to just fucking get along with life and want to just deal with things. Someone saying no. No, of course not. Of course not. <laughs> Race is not a minority. We live in a racialist system. That, that's totally entirely what you're saying. Race is a non-minority, and I'm happy it's for you. It's the system. It's the system. It's not the people. It's yeah, the but you system. cannot associate this. And, and the intentions behind those legislations. Sorry, you speak. Uh, we can't. We just can't you know, dissociate the system with, 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 uh, 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 with the people. I mean, that's... Uh, uh, but there's a minority of people in power. There's not a majority of people. In yeah, power. that's power. Uh, well, you that's know, as as it was said uh, earlier, that uh, that's how the mm, uh, from ESO um, racist theories were 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 created that that way. It's a, it's a it's a whole system, and then uh, it it started with the uh, with the slavery, modernity, and so on. But population has embraced that ideology up until now. And we see that really in France, how how the the, the French Enlightenment has theorized uh, races and how it plays along with the with, with the French society. Uh, so today, if Trump is so popular, it's because the whole population has uh, the majority of population has embraced that ide ideology. And we can have uh, liberals, white people, nice, etc. I mean, uh. uh um, okay, I, I just lost my. We can have all these nice people, but the racist ideology persists, and we have uh, we need to fight it in different ways. Yeah. We cannot just say uh, raci racism is not uh, it's just for uh, for minority when you yourself you don't experience it as you're saying, which I don't believe really 
as a people of color. But yeah, most of us experience it every day from France to, to Eastern Europe. Yeah, but also I really agree with you. And that was really the point that I was trying to make when I was talking about how the definition of a racist <laughs> has been reduced to three things. The individual who, con who consciously dislikes white people and uh, non-white people and who intends to harm them. I think this is the definition that we now have of racism in the system that we live in. When, when we talk about racism, so for example, if... Um, Say I say something racist to uh, say I say something racist to a person of color. My intent was not to say something racist. My intent was never to harm them, but I did say so. This has happened to me in my life, you know. And people will say that person of color will say to me, "Oh, Isol, that thing that you just said that was that was racist," you know. And my instinct reaction, because I think. You know, this is controversial opinion, but I'm white. I'm fundamentally racist. And this is not like flagellation, self-flagellation. As I said in the presentation, it's not my fault, but it is my responsibility. And so in that particular case, um, I've kind of lost my train of thought. But, but yeah, what I'm trying to say is just like, um, yeah, I've lost it. I've lost it. But you, you yeah. No, I hear you. <laughs> I, I hear you, and I feel like what Isolde is expressing is just the general sentiment of white people who feel like um, they are allies. That's it. But, the, but they don't listen. But they. But but we don't listen. And no, the, but like I feel like I feel like Isolde, like I, after like, you know I know you, so I I. I appreciate that you are outspoken about um, racism because, you know, I, I, I know you. I, I, and I, a, a point as well is to say, even as, a, as an ally, she still produces racist thoughts. And that's, I'm, I'm a black. I'm a man, let's say, I'm, a man. I'm still reproducing sexist thoughts because we, we have been raised under that, under that system. And it's up to me and it's up to her uh, to try, and that's what she's doing, to try to recover from her racist ideology totally that she has inherited. I totally and agree. and uh, there's, there's, there's a good example about uh, white fragility, the lady who wrote white, white fragility. She's very sharp, she's very sharp. Yet she's, uh, she was giving an example of how she, herself she's kind of reproducing this kind of racist thoughts, even as a highly intellectual um, academic. So, so basically, yeah. it's all about decolonizing the mind. Right. It's all right, about that. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, guys, uh, thank you very much. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel, but it's been three yeah. hours, so it's a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's about time. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just before we go, I'll just I'll just like to say something on the issue of appropriation. So yeah. like Chelsea said earlier, um I mean I equally feel the same being being African, you know, when I see somebody just trying to pick up a few things from my culture. I don't have a problem with that because we do that here in Africa all the time. Our women are wearing weaves and trying to look like western women and and all that so but when um but you but mostly when a white person tries to like emulate like maybe something from black black culture or just another you know another ethnic group they they usually get uh, get the heat you know from other people from uh, usually like the the people that own the culture or whatever but don't you think that kind of like uh don't you guys think that kind of creates part of the problem you know like some kind of defense mechanism like don't you think it kind of like sparks something in white most white people's minds to kind of like want to defend themselves white so, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think oh, it's important to note like the power as we've said like within this cultural appropriation just like talk in general you know the power at play and you know like I hear your point you know black people are wearing weaves and all of this but at the same time you know they are the oppressed and they are taking something from a dominant culture because you know they have been whitewashed <laughs> have been yeah. 
that you know white European hair is beautiful and black like natural uh-huh. is like horrible. So I don't think it's it doesn't hold the same weight because you don't have like all of these oppressive factors kind of you know. But is that is but that's not entirely the case because I've I've tried to talk to some people. I mean even myself. I mean I'm not an exception. You know I do I do stuff that you know most mostly are not done like i do like to you know take part in activities that are not mostly done in like black communities you know so yeah. i mean it's just because i enjoy it but yeah i'm feeling okay sorry carry on carry on no go chelsea sorry no no no. i mean uh Tali was was gonna say something yeah um so yeah, definitely the white race, I mean, white people are dominant, but being, them being stopped or being stopped, them being stopped from, uh, from emulating, from um, embracing cu- different cultures and things like that, don't you think that kind of like validates the fact that we, uh, kind of validates the fact that we feel inferior? I do agree with that. And I think... I completely agree with that. I feel like the way forward is acknowledging the people who are putting work in to help us move forward. And that Mm -hmm. has to include white people. And it also has to include ignorance people of all races. Because as much as we may be we may understand the intersectionalities of um like experience i feel like we don't really apply that to blackness we're not allowed to be black in a different way because then we're failing the forward movement of like abolishing racism and I've personally felt that a lot um, because I don't want to be black in one way I'm not an African-American working through racism in my own country where my police are stopping me for simply being black and driving I've never had that experience and in Kenya the fact that people come to our country and um, like, you know, boost our tourism economy is a good thing because we have to understand that people are living below the poverty line in Kenya and they're going to use every opportunity in capitalist society um, to uh, to to earn money to earn a living and to earn a living that's not supported by the state and i think that that's why we feel more open to embracing tourism people coming to visit people exchanging in our cultures because it's one of the main um sources of income income a lot of people in developing countries i i don't think that taking the perspective of, well, that's intrinsically white supremacist, that's intrinsically racist, is doing anything for people who need to be living and people who want to simply just live their, their, their independent life um, being black, being Asian, being gay, being any oppressed group. Um, we have to rely on our allies to just simply abolish the thing that we never even wanted to be in, you know? Like, I hate being, my friend says to me, she's like, you know, when a white, people, when a white person asks me a question about racism, like a genuine question about racism, I always say, like, are you going to pay me? Are you going to pay me? For yes, I remember when Kanye said that. Kanye says, fuck you, pay me. Yeah. Pay me for the time that I'm investing to educate you. Pay me for the time that I'm investing, for the time that you're not going on Google and educating yourself. Like Wikipedia. It's not my job to take time out of my independent, selfish life to make sure that you're living yours correctly. 
then, yeah, just okay. also, what, what, I, can, I can also give an example of uh, 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 the Talis sage. Um, uh, the, the other example is about whitening the, uh, the skin, bleaching the, the skin. So, uh, yeah, it's not the same way here when, when black people or Asian people uh, from Indonesia especially try to whiten their skin. It's a question of, uh, again, of power dynamic. We cannot just reduce the racist thought uh, the rest of thing as uh, as um, the hatred between um, white and black. It's a system of thought. Uh, the question of aesthetic it's it's central in the uh, in the racial in the racialist thought. So yeah, people are uh, Africans, uh, especially they try to look like white because the the concept of beauty was centralized uh, around the white beauty. So here it's not the same, the same way it really. It's, uh, it's, tot it's totally different from a white person trying to get a darker skin, for example. It's totally, uh, totally different. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm gonna put a halt to the conversation because it's been three hours. But <laughs> for that, I'm going to read to you a Kate Tempest quote because <laughs> we love yes. to hear her. Yeah. So. It's hard to accept, this is from her latest album. <laughs> it's hard to accept that we're all one in the same flesh, given the rampant divisions between oppressor and oppressed, but we are though. More empathy, less greed, more respect. Thank you for sharing. Oh. Love, love you. <laughs> okay, thank you for the nice oh. talk. Thank you guys. I'll say goodbye to you. Yeah. That was great. Thank, thank you guys. It was amazing. Such a rich yeah. conversation. It was uh, really, really so interesting. And um, and we hope we're we're gonna try to do more on these. I think we're gonna do one on coronavirus, one on the unbearable whiteness of green, which I think Ooh. those <laughs> Okay, interesting. <laughs> Sign me up. The what? Yeah. <laughs> what did you say, Justin? Sign me up, I think he said. Sign me up. Oh, and also, and also white feminism. Anyway, much, much more to come. I would love to hear one on blackness. Like the yeah. same. Yeah, we probably should. Like, <laughs> like just like, like blackness. Yeah, yeah, we should. But it. If you have any ideas, like literally just ask us. Like, so as we said, we have like a. a we can organize them with other people because this is like super informal. So if you want to organize one, let's do it, you know? Yeah. And sit down. Like if you want to do it on um, like being an African growing up abroad or we're, because we're going to do one on traveling and like the concept of abroad. So uh, yeah, I would love to have like a, a global place. citizen, please. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Sign some sort of one. representation. Yeah, okay. no, for real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much, everyone. This was really, really rich. Thank you, Rose. This was really amazing. So yeah, thank you. That was. Bye. Bye bye everyone.